Дорогие коллеги и друзья, от лица журнала «Новое литературное обозрение» я приветствую вас на наших 27-х банных чтениях, поскольку в этом году мы проводим эти чтения в онлайн. Уже на прошлую неделю, в субботу-воскресенье, было первые две секции, сегодня мы открываем третью секцию. Название нашей конференции «Антропология насилия. Государство». Общество и культура. И в прошлый раз, то есть в прошлую субботу и воскресенье, мы обсуждали проблематику государственного насилия, каким образом государство легитимирует насилие по отношению к обществу, каковы сложные взаимоотношения между государством и обществом как таковым. Большой акцент был сделан на войне, где насилие становится неизбежным и порождает очень серьезные последствия в общественной жизни. И сегодня у нас третья секция, которая посвящена обществу и насилию. Я приветствую всех участников, я очень признательна, что они согласились участвовать в банных чтениях. И также надеюсь, что наши слушатели и зрители в YouTube будут слушать и активно задавать вопросы. Напомню, что это уже сложившаяся традиция, когда после каждого доклада могут задаваться вопросы и будет, собственно, дискуссия. Я всех приветствую, передаю бразды правления Татьяны Вайзер, которая сегодня будет модератором конференции. Дорогие коллеги, добрый день, мы очень рады вас приветствовать с нами и надеемся, что вы были... С нами с самого начала конференции уже прошло два дня и две секции. Сегодня у нас третий день банных чтений. И на этой секции мы поговорим о том, как происходит милитаризация российского общества, как исторически происходила радикализация политических форм насилия и попытаемся более четко определить категориальный аппарат, связанный с самим понятием насилия. Я прошу докладчиков держаться регламента, доклады длятся 20 минут, и вопросы, реплики и дискуссия длится также 20 минут. Докладчики, пожалуйста, говорите. Will be more fruitful in their answers and us in YouTube or Facebook. I am presenting our first speaker, Karola Dietze, uh, the uh, Friedrich Schiller University, the invention of terrorism in the 19th century. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank Irina Prohorova and her team at NLO for inviting me to the 27th Bathhouse readings. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with you today, if only virtually, and to be able to present and discuss my research on the invention of terrorism in 19th century Europe, Russia and the United States with you. It is a standard narrative of the global hot history of terrorism uh, prevalent in history as well as the social sciences. This narrative has been written by political scientists in the times of the Cold War. David C. Rappaport, for instance, in the 1970s and 80s, developed an influential theoretical approach to the history of terrorism. He argues that a religiously inspired pre-modern terrorism existed, and he cites the so-called Sicarii, the assassins, and the thugs as examples. Modern terrorism for Rappaport begins in 1878 in Russia and can be divided into four ideological waves, anarchist, anti-colonial, new left, and religious. This narrative of the antique forerunners of terrorism found in 
religious violence and tyrannicide, the origins of revolutionary terrorism in the terror of the French Revolution, and its evolution by way of the Narodnaya Volia in Tsarist Russia and anarchist individuals in Western Europe and the United States is today considered valid by the overwhelming portion of the current literature on terrorism and its history. In this literature, there is also basic consensus on classifying terrorism according to the categories of social, revolutionary, ethnic, nationalistic, and radically right wing. In the 1990s, religious terrorism was added as a fourth category. But is this standard narrative of the global history of terrorism actually true? Can it be corroborated by empirical historical research? This is the question I set out to solve. The answer is that the standard narrative of the global history of terrorism needs to be revised in crucial parts. So let me give you my a historian's story. In order to identify acts of terrorism in history, we need to know what we are looking for. This is why we first need to ask, what is terrorism and how does it function? According to the German sociologist Peter Waldmann's definition, terrorism is violence against a political order from below, which is planned and prepared and meant to be shocking. Such acts of violence are supposed to spread feelings of insecurity and intense fear, but they are also meant to generate sympathy and support. Waldmann stresses that for a terrorist act to be successful, the symbolic effect of the violence, its message, is more important than its instrumental effect, the destruction it causes. Terrorism is primarily a communication strategy, he writes. Most definitions by social and political scientists across the world agree with Waldmann's that terrorism is the use of spectacular symbolic violence with the primary aim of conveying a political message to target audiences and through their reactions affect political and social change. From today's perspective, the functioning of terrorism's social political logic may seem trivial enough. It was not trivial, however, for political actors in the 19th century to first comprehend and successfully exploit this logic. And this is why we can trace the learning process it took political actors to invent the tactic of terrorism. Terrorism was invented when spectacular violence was combined with mass media reporting to address a mass public. The process of this invention happened within a short period of time. It began in 1858 and was completed in 1866. But it spanned a fairly large geographical space, Europe, United States and Russia. Five men can be identified as the decisive inventors of terrorism. They participated in this process to different degrees. The first two were Felice Orsini, who tried to assassinate the French Emperor Napoleon III in Paris in 1858, and John Brown, who raided Harpers Ferry in 1859. They committed acts of violence, which firstly meet all the criteria for terrorism, and secondly, were the result of original thought and action, and not predominantly a copy of previous acts. Thirdly, their violent acts inspired others, namely Oskar Becker, who attacked the Prussian king, William I, in 1868, uh, 61, sorry, John Wilkes Booth, who shot the American president, Abraham Lincoln, in 1865, and Dmitry Vladimirovich Karakosov, who tried to kill the Russian Tsar Alexander II in 1866. 
The latter three are the first imitators for whom it has been possible to show that they directly or indirectly received the news of Orsini's and Brown's deeds, imitated them, and in doing so, developed the tactic further. Let me briefly introduce these gentlemen and their deeds. Curiously enough, the invention of terrorism began with the cooperation between an assassin and his intended victim. On January 14, 1858, the Italian nobleman, Felice Orsini, tried to kill the French emperor, Napoleon III. His attempt to kill Napoleon III differed from previous attacks in two respects. First, Orsini tried to outdo earlier assassins by staging an especially spectacular assassination. While most previous assassins had used knives and pistols, Orsini mainly relied on the latest weapon technology, grenades as large as Dutch cheese, originally developed in the Crimean War, which would detonate the very moment they hit the ground. Second, Felice Orsini did not intend to kill Napoleon III only in an instrumental fashion. Instead, Napoleon was to be a symbolic victim. Orsini and his co-conspirators co mainly intended to convey a political message to target audiences in order to affect political change. They believed that the assassination of Napoleon III would be a signal to the French people to start a revolution, which in turn would be a signal to Italians and other Europeans to start a revolution as well just as it had happened in 1830-31 and 1848-49. Moreover, according to Orsini, it was Napoleon III alone who blocked all progressive development, not just in the Italian states, but also in the whole of Europe. Once this obstacle was removed through Napoleon's assassination, Orsini believed it would trigger a chain reaction and open the path for the liberation of the whole of Europe. Thus, Orsini's plan to assassinate Napoleon III contains all the elements of terrorism as it is defined today. Significantly, Orsini's plan was only partial, partially realized initially. Only two aspects of this plan worked out immediately. First, the attempt to stage a spectacularly shocking assassination succeeded, although Napoleon III was not killed in the event. But even if the emperor escaped, Orsini's bombs wounded 156 people, eight or even 14 of whom ultimately died. This was the bloodiest terrorist act in the 19th century. Second, Orsini also succeeded to transform the national and international mass media into a sounding board, which enabled him to reach his target audiences. All over Europe and in Russia, the assassination attempt was immediately considered headline news, and within days, the public was informed about this violent act. Orsini and his co-conspirators failed politically, however because they were unable to convey a clear political message to their target audiences and through their reactions affect political change. If usual procedures had prevailed, Orsini's attempt would not have had any further political consequences. He and his co-conspirators would have been tried in court, condemned to death, executed, and that would have been the end of the story. In this case, however, events took a different turn, and as a result of this a transatlantic collective learning process of the invention of terrorism set in. The reason for this unlikely, unforeseen and unpredictable change of luck, from Orsini's perspective, was that Napoleon decided to cooperate with his would-be assassin. After the bloodbath in front of the Italian opera in Paris, politicians immediately started to hijack the event for their own purposes. Napoleon III especially began to plan a military intervention in order to affect the unification of Northern Italy. 
In order to gain the support of the public, he helped Orsini's trial to become a European media event in its own right. As Orsini expected to receive the death penalty, he could freely explain his deed and express his admiration for the principles of the French Revolution and for Napoleon I, whom his father had served. In this way, Orsini managed to make a positive impression on his audience in the courtroom. The French official newspaper published the court proceedings. This was unheard of. In this way, it successfully spread Orsini's political message to his target audiences all over Europe, including Russia, but with some exception for Austria-Hungary. The public explanation of Orsini's deed quickly produced visible results. When Orsini was executed in mid-March, many in France, the Italian states and the United Kingdom celebrated him as a martyr. After Orsini's death, Napoleon continued to pursue his new policies concerning the unification of Italy. In February 1861, after the Second War of Independence, as it came to be called, Italy was officially united under the rule of the Sardinian king. In this way, the French emperor crowned his assassin's failed attempt to kill him with public and political success. Orsini's main political objective, unification, was realized. Orsini's political effectiveness let the tactic he employed look attractive to others, searching for ways to reverse the social and or political order in their countries. The new means of transportation and communication, as well as the new media, enabled these radicals to learn of the event and the political upheaval it caused. The news of Orsini's deed first reached North America on the paddle wheel steamer Canada, run by the Cunard Line. The boat left Liverpool on January 16, 1858, at 10.20 a.m., the first day of in-depth coverage of Orsini's deed, and it entered the port of Halifax in British North America, today is Canada, on January 28th at 4 a.m. Um, you can see the Arabia here, which left Liverpool a few days later with the decisive package then of the news on Orsini's attempt. American newspapers reported on Orsini's attempt to kill Napoleon III with as much interest and in as much detail as the European press. And the American public followed these events as closely as the one in Europe. Many so-called 48ers, revolutionaries exiled from Europe after 1849, as well as American born in the country, openly sympathized with Orsini, especially those that were also active in the abolitionist movement. One of the abolitionists who, in all likelihood, followed attentively the reporting on Orsini's assassination attempt and political and public reactions in Europe, as well as in the United States, was John Brown. It was the American abolitionist John Brown who first succeeded in assembling all parts of the tactic on of his own accord. He thus takes a central role in the process of the invention of terrorism. One of the first to point to the congruence of tactics was Abraham Lincoln who sharply observed in February 1860 that Orsini's attempt on Louis Napoleon and John Brown's attempt at Harpers Ferry were, in their philosophy, precisely the same. On Sunday, October 16, 1859, John Brown set out together with some 20 volunteers to take in Harpers Ferry. This small town in Northern Virginia, now West Virginia, at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, housed rifle factories and an arsenal of the US military. Attacking the only rifle factory and arsenal in the South would hit a war nerve given Southern fears, especially the fear that jo John Brown might use these weapons to arm a slave rebellion. 
Born in 1800, John Brown had fought for the abolition of slavery and helped slaves on their way to freedom all his life. Since the mid 1840s, he had conceived of a plan of how he wanted to bring about the abolition of slavery generally in the United States. Basically, this was an offensive version of the Underground Railroad, including guerrilla tactics. Right after the first detailed reports on Orsini's deeds and the political reactions it provoked had appeared in major US newspapers, Brown modified his long cherished plan, however. The modified plan now incorporated the decisive elements of terrorist tactics, the use of spectacular symbolic violence with the primary aim of conveying a political message to target audiences and to their reactions affect political and social change. Brown's procrastination in Harpers Ferry can be explained in this way. After the raid, Brown was extremely successful in spreading his message to target audiences in the north northern and the southern states. And just as he had expected and most certainly learned from Orsini's example, his raid on Harpers Ferry further polarized and radicalized the American public at breathtaking speed. This radicalization and polarization of American society prepared the ground for secession, which led to the Civil War and to the abolition of slavery, a development entirely in correspondence with John Brown's analysis of the political situation and future developments. Just like Felice Orsini and his in his assassination attempt. John Brown and his raid on Harpers Ferry triggered political developments, which in the end led to a realization of his political objectives. And just as in Orsini's case, Brown and his raid became the focal point for a transatlantic media event in the United States, Europe and Russia. At least three radicals in Europe and the United States were inspired by Felice Orsini's and John Brown's effective use of the terrorist tactics for the achievement of their political aims and decided to imitate them. The contagion effect, the influence of media exposure on the beh future behavior of other like-minded extremists is thus part of the story of terrorism right from the beginning. The first imitators for whom it has been possible to show that they received the news of Orsini's and Brown's deeds and acted upon their example were no more imitators, however, but they also developed the tactic further. First, they finalized it by inventing the genre of the Bekennerschreiben in German, Britain claim of responsibility, which would become typical for terrorism in the 19th and 20th centuries. And second, they universalized the tactic by using it for counter-revolutionary counter goals. With the development of the Bekennerschreiben and what is called right-wing terrorism, the invention of terrorism was complete. The first of the three imitators was Oskar Wilhelm Becker in Germany. Becker, born in Odessa to parents of German descent, was a law student at the University of Leipzig. After his attempt to assassinate the Prussian king, William I had failed, he explained to the examining court jury the terrorist tactics which he had tried to put into practice. And he asserted that his role model was Felice Orsini. Just as Orsini's assassination attempt had contributed to the unification of Italy, he had intended to contribute to the unification of Germany. According to the minutes of the interrogations, he already used the term to terrorize as a transitive verb similar to today's usage for the effect his violent act was supposed to have on the princes in the German states. His deed became the starting point for a European and, to some degree, also transatlantic media event. Still, it failed. One important reason for this failure was that the government and the public consciously tried to prevent the instrumentalization of Becker's assassination attempt by politicians and the media, and in this way avert the radicalization and polarization of the public in the German lands. <laughs> 
In the United States, both Orsini and Brown served as a reference point for John Wilkes Booth, the second of the three imitators. When Lincoln, after the surrender of General Robert E. Lee, announced that he would confer the ballot on former slaves, at least on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers, Booth decided to kill the president, whom he deemed to be an illegitim illegitimate office holder. The instrumental effect of the violence proved successful. Abraham Lincoln died from the wounds that he had received early in the next morning. But the symbolic effect of the violence Booth had intended, its message was transmitted to his target audiences in a rudimentary fashion only. Booth expected that Confederates and their sympathizers would celebrate him for his deed, just, at, just like Orsini and Brown had been celebrated. But his high hopes came to naught. Southerners who held a more realistic judgment of the political situation extended the cold hand to him and his Bekennerschreiben to the editors of the Washington newspaper did not appear. The communication strategy failed and with it the intended act of terrorism. For the third imitator, Dmitry Vladimirovich Karakusov in Russia, there is evidence that Orsini, Brown and Booth all served as reference points. The way in which Karakursov received news of John Brown is especially interesting. The Russian revolutionary journalist and writer Nikolai Chernyshevsky was a close and sympathetic and well-informed observer of the democratic experiment in the United States on which he regularly reported. When Chernyshevsky read the news on John Brown and his raid on Harper's Ferry in European and possibly also American newspapers, he was deeply impressed and reported on John Brown fairly extensively. After Chernyshevsky was put into prison, he still managed to write and published a novel called What is to be Done. In this book, he modeled his hero, Rachmetov, the epitome of the new man on John Brown or rather on what he had read on John Brown. Rachmetov in turn became a role model for Karakosov. Similar to Orsini, Karakosov, through his attempt to assassinate Tsar Alexander II, tried to trigger a revolution, which would lead to real freedom, Nastayashaya Volya, a fair distribution of land and capital among the population, and democratic self-rule, not least in order to better the living conditions for the newly emancipated serfs in Russia. With their violent acts, the invention of the fundamental terrorist tactic was completed. This pertains to its socio-political logic, its functioning, as well as to the three political orientations, ethnic nationalist, social revolutionary, and radically right-wing. Thus, since 1866, the terrorist tactic has existed in the repertoire for violent political struggles. Later imitators only needed to adapt it to so societal and technical changes, as well as new developments in the field of the media. This outcome confirms some assumptions and interpretations which have been common in the historiography on terrorism so far, but modifies others. The outcome confirms that terrorism is a product of what is usually called modernity, but it places the emergence of the terrorist tactic in a new chronology, a new geography, and in different historical contexts. Regarding the chronology, terrorism emerged 20 years earlier than has generally been assumed. The tactic was invented in a transnational process starting in 1858, when Felice Orsini attempted to kill Napoleon III, and not in the years which are commonly found in the literature on the history of terrorism. 1878, when Vera Sasulic made her attempt on Trepov, or 1879, when Narod Nayavolia was founded. Orsini, Becker, Brown, Booth, and Karakosov precede and thus replace the anarchists and nihilists which up to now have been regarded as the inventors of terrorism by most historians. As far as the geography is concerned, the transnational invention of terrorism has to be situated mainly in the history of Western Europe and the United States, 
instead of Russian history. It was in Western history and the United States that the transportation, communication and media revolutions were furthest advanced and social movements as well as revolutionary ideals and traditions were the most em eminent. Moreover, the invention of terrorism was a transnational process. By the middle of the 19th century, the revolutions in the field of transportation, communication and the media had forged a common communicative space between Europe, Russia and the United States. And this communicative space is also the reason why Felice Orsini must be viewed not just within the context of West European, but also of American history, while John Brown is not only a part of American, but also of Russian history. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Carola, for your so founded historical research and su such histo historical detail is not to great knowledge of our audience. We should ask if anybody has a replica or commentary or participants or the viewers who are watching us in the YouTube can channel. Carola, thank you so much. It was a magnificent talk. It is very interesting. You know, Russia is not original anymore. And, I, for, and I'm glad about it that I'm not at least original. <laughs> or we are not the first ones to invent terrorism. But, but my question is not, not so much a question, a commentary. Terrorism is, was born it's, it's a birth of media, and we can see that, as you just I were very just in saying that that the message needs this, it is born as a message that needs being spread. But me, we can see how media are vulnerable; they cannot but tell about this event. Am I right in understanding that theoretically? The, uh, th terrorism should be fought uh, by ignoring it if media is not writing about it. So what's the meaning of terrorism if nobody is talking about it? it? It's not spread. So it, it, am I right in understanding that media are helpless before terrorism because they are uh, their essence is such because they have to write about it because it's a focal event. And therefore, the fight with terrorism becomes problematic. Um, yes, thank you very much for this question, uh, which is very important, um, I think. Yes, it's true that um, media cannot not report on terrorism because um, the events are too important to a very large um, part of the population. The population is vulnerable, so it does want to know about these uh, events um, and this is why it is very difficult to deal with the terrorism it's it's a difficult um, uh, um, genre of violence to be dealt with it's a difficult tactic for the media to be to, to deal with it but still there are differences in how the media can deal with terrorism and I would argue that these differences in how terrorism is reported on make all the difference. Um, you can report on terrorism in a very factual manner, um, uh, trying to explain, trying to um, yeah, be very um, um, fact orientated. Um, and in this way, report on it uh, and not um, yeah, leave the public out of what happening, but not instrumentalize it and not enlarge it in any way. And um, I think it's, it's uh, for example, 
<laughs> history is, is good here because you can actually show the difference and you can actually see the difference um, and how it worked out historically. You can use history as an experiment and, and watch the difference. Um, and the example of John Brown is, is very educating here, I think, because in the very beginning, the media did report on the on this raid on Harpers Ferry, but it reported in a way, and the same with Orsini, by the way, they, uh, the media reported in a way which did not uh, enlarge the violence, uh, which um, um, yeah, basically, or, or very, very strictly said that this violence was not good. It, it was not helpful. It didn't lead anywhere. Um, and in this way, um, it didn't really um, make it attractive um, as an act to be repeated or yeah, um, kind of used in, in other parts of the world. And um, only after a couple of weeks, this changed. And um, the, the major difference in the reporting was that in the beginning, um, the media concentrated just on the instrumental violence. Yeah, and this is very clear to be seen for, for Harper's Ferry, where the media just kind of wondered what, what are these people doing? This is crazy, really. They can't win. Um, what, what's the purpose of this, really? Um, there are just people who are dead. There are people who are um, injured. So, so what is this for? And after a while, um, the symbolic meaning of the act was actually reported more and more. And this is when the polarization and the uh, radicalization of the public itself began, because it began then to identify with John Brown or really bedevil him. And this is, so, so there is, um, there are ways in which the media can report on terrorism without enlarging it. And there are other ways in which it definitely is uh, using it politically and enlarging it. And people at that time very much recognized the difference and were very alarmed about it. And that is also interesting because we have, we have, we are so used um, to to political uh, to acts of terrorism being used politically, um, that for those people it was much easier to see the difference than maybe it is for us now. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, of course I understand. First of all, nowadays we have internet, so mm -hmm. which uh, does not simplify the situation yeah. in a, But really, I remember how the archaeologists. Uh, implore the media, not yeah. to mention then Palmyra is a kind of under UNESCO uh, protection yeah. uh, because yeah. because uh, it creates a political issue. But yes. somehow every type of media just was very furious <laughs> and saying this this is a great monument. So and it gave a further impetus to uh, to terrorists in a way. So yes. I'm afraid that in this way somehow this is. Um, Achilles heel, you know, of the media. They can't find the remedy, uh, either not to mention at all or how to mention. Still, there is no receipt, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry, yeah. but uh, I see that uh, Hans Ulle Gumbrecht is wishing. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> didn't want to interfere. Oh, thank you. To, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to say to Tatiana, I, I don't get the translation. I mean, because it's not very important because so far it's been all in English. But uh, OK, so um, maybe I, I continue with uh, an implication of Irina's question. I try to be relatively compact. But first of all, congratulations, uh, Carola. I think this was uh, I had never really thought about terrorism in this historical way. You think about the concept, but I think this was uh, a very convincing genealogy. I would say the key implication was you need two things for terrorism to, to emerge. I mean, one thing is, of course, media. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the typical German answer also because everything, the answer to every question in German is always media, at least in the humanities. Uh, and then, of course, you need a public sphere. And I would add, and this is really my question, you need a passionate public sphere. You know, if you have a public sphere that's tired, it will not work. 
And this is now my real question, and it's not meant to be a provocative question, but it's a question to you. And I think it it was an implication of what Irina was talking about. Could one say that perhaps today, at least in certain regions, so and I would include into that region the European Union and uh, let's say post-Trump United States, um, we have maybe arrived um, at uh, the end of this genealogy of terrorism for two reasons. Uh, Irina, in a different context, already mentioned one, and one is the internet. Let's say you do no longer have uh, what you call light median, for example, in Germany, right? I mean, when I was a teenager in Germany, you had to watch the Target show at eight o'clock and everybody watched that. That does no longer exist. So um, you can no longer be sure uh, that uh, what you did gets covered in a central way. And then secondly, um, and that would also be an arc that started in the time you focus upon mid-19th century. If you say that mid-19th century in Europe and America, and in Russia in a way, was the time where this um, already existing or emerging public sphere was charged with passion, that we have come to an end of that. I mean, it is like, uh, you know, you can see that in participation in elections, for example. I mean, less and less people go to elections. Uh, politics in the media is less and less central. So um, you cannot, and I mean, you could also add that um, statehood has gotten much better in controlling media altogether. My real question to you, I mean, I want to get your reaction to that is, could one say that we are now beginning to be at the end of the genealogy whose origin you so precisely reconstructed? Um, thank you very much for this question also. It's, um, you are completely correct, and, and in the book I elaborate on that a little further, that what one also needs is um, the political subject. Mm -hmm. um, people who take part in politics, who think politically, um, and for whom politi politics are important and who actually follow the media. And this is something created through the revolutions in the United States as well as in Europe. And um, the spread of media, the, the lowering of prices. So the penny press is really mm -hmm. crucial in this because this is the first time um, not only rich people can afford a newspaper, but everybody can buy it on the streets, in the streets um, for a penny if kind of it's interesting enough and so news gets more interesting <laughs> in a way um, takes up violence um, yeah violence is food for these this type of newspaper but also it's it's a fundamental precondition for for the existing on and for terrorism to come um, uh, to be invented and the political subject is as well and I, I think one can also show that um, kind of a, 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 um, a continuous, flow of media reporting is also very important and so speed comes in here mm -hmm. because only if you get news on a regular basis um, you will be so excited or excited enough to um, to really take part as an audience in terrorism and all of this comes together as one can or as I think I could show in, in the 1830s to 1850s and is kind of yeah prepared in the 1850s, yeah, through the telegraph and, and these inventions, mm -hmm. um, so that you got this media sphere, you got these political subjects who take part and um, yes, so this can be described fairly clearly. Now your question uh, very, interesting, very interestingly um, addresses our time and the question how did the media world and the political world really change um, in order to affect this, this logic. And I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. I don't have a ready-made answer for this. I, I, it's, it's a large question. But one thing I think is, one thing that's crucial is indeed the internet, as Irina Pokhova also has um, put forward already, not least because the internet makes it possible for terrorist groups um, in a very easy way to convey their own news um, and their stories about their terrorist acts. So while, as you mentioned, for 
for the longest time in the 20th century, you had kind of gatekeepers for news who would select news um, for publication, either in print or radio, on radio or on television. Um, this has been lost by the internet because groups like Daesh can just um, stream their own um, videos of the headings and terrorist acts into the internet right away. So what happens if this, yeah, what, what can we observe with this development? We can observe that there are, that there is no broad public anymore, which will actually um, receive these news um, in the same way. There are, there are specific groups which actually go to these pages and watch these news and let themselves affect by it. Um, there are the major news outlets which will also new, use these videos but show them only in, in um, censored ways really by yeah, um, taking care of, of um, 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 yeah, putting, um, not, not really showing the beheading itself or, or protecting the people who are beheaded in, in the visual images and in this way adhere to ethical standards. Um, and, and so in a way the, the society is breaking up in, in the way it's, it's uh, absorbing um, such news. So there are more possibilities to really uh, get the news out in, in the way terrorists want on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, yeah, the audience is split. Um, but this also is affecting the ways, um, yeah, the, these news are then uh, further, uh, yeah, further affect political action and political um, developments in societies. And the other question is, is the political subject still um, alive in the way it developed in the 19th century? Um, and that is a very large and interesting question also to which I am not sure if I do have an answer, but I also, have, my intuition would be that we, we can observe other differentiations in society, that there are uh, the so-called elites, yeah, which uh, other groups in society are not very fond of, they are still political subjects. They still follow news. They, um, yeah, and and there are other groups um, who more and more get lost in this process. And, and we become the influencers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And how to cope with this is. I don't think it's an easy situation and, and something that for democracy um, is vital that we that we solve these problems, yes, and address them. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Carola. Johanna Schwartz has the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, mm -hmm. so Carola, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I think it's very important to see the history of um, terrorism as a, and to analyze the, the, the change of aims and targets and also the techniques and how it works. And my question is uh, about the same that has already been asked. Um, and how has terrorism changed now in the 20th century and the 21st century? We have already talked about the importance of internet, of media, but another question would be, um, how have the targets um, been changed in this uh, time of period? So um, the um, case studies you had from the beginning of terrorism, that was always the target was the top of the state, like the king mm -hmm. or the... the um, a SAR or something like this. And in West Germany, for example, if we look at the German Red Army fraction, it's still the same. They they uh, try to kill the top of the state. They say it's not only uh, not anymore the Bundeskanzler, but it's the um, uh, a big uh, businessman or the sh a chef of a bank or something like this. They also kill only the top of the society, uh, economic top. And now... Um, hasn't uh, the targets of terrorism changed? I mean, if we look at 9-11, it doesn't matter 
who is being killed. The target is, okay, it's still, uh, uh, yes, the headquarter of the bank system, if you want, uh, but um, the people, um, it's not, it doesn't matter anymore how many people die in this, these acts of terror. Or if you look on Hamas on uh, Israel now nowadays, they they the target is doesn't matter who is being killed. It's just you you try to target a city like Tel Aviv or something. So that's my question: How has um, the targets of terrorism changed over time until today? So what what uh, what historical development would you see there? Um, yeah, first of all, hi Johannes, nice to see you <laughs> in this way. Um, thank you for this question also. Um, it, it also is, is a large question and you're right that in the beginning it was mostly heads of state um, that were targeted. Um, and at that time, it was, uh, although there are certainly exceptions, I mean, uh, John Brown's raid on Harpers Ferry would be such an exception and, and there are others. Um, but um, there is a development overall which can be explained by a couple of factors. One factor is that heads of stain are um, much better protected after a while. Yeah, so we are starting out in a time when um, people like Abraham Lincoln or um, yeah, the, the, the Prussian king would walk around in parks and not be protected. Or Alexander II just walked around Petersburg with his dog. I mean, that was it. They would not have any police, nobody there. And this was well known to everybody in the population. They weren't protected. And it was part of the honor of a king not to be protected because you were loved by your people and you didn't need protection. So that was the logic behind that. And this changed with attacks. So with more attacks. Uh, kings and, and heads of state needed more protection and received more protection, even though this was very, um, they didn't like that for a long time. And uh, the Prussian king and emperor then, William I, he, he kind of didn't want any protection until the end of his life. And he had several attacks on his life and still he didn't want any protection. I mean, it was just a question of honor, really. And um, and the same can be can be seen for for others. Um, and towards and then the kind of the the aims and the targets of uh, terrorism they change a lot with the ideology. Yes, yeah, so already with the anarchists you would get um, attacks on cafes, for example, or the Bologna Opera. So. And anybody who was sitting in a cafe, uh, which was just considered to be bourgeois, would be attacked. And it didn't matter who that was. Or everybody who was in the opera um, and who would be considered bourgeois would be attacked. So with changes in ideology, the targets change, which is kind of um, understandable. And with opportunity also. So while kings... And, and heads of state were more protected. Um, the general population became um, came more into view for terrorists because it was easy, a, a soft target simply. And um, still, heads of state would be killed. Yeah, as um, as long into the 20th century, and certain groups like um, the RIF would still kind of um, yeah attempt to. Um, attack especially uh, heads of state. But for example, right-wing groups would mostly always attack rather weak parts in society, yeah? um, because it's, it's part of their ideology that, uh, that they want to um, make these people feel unsafe or um, drive out of a town or village or part uh, of a town or something like that. Um, and uh, so, so there is a close link. 9-11 um, is, uh, to a certain extent, an exception because an exceptionally high number of people died. Um, there are very few attempts with a similar death rate, really. Um, and yeah, target the target was the, the symbol 
of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and uh, probably the White House or the Congress uh, of the fourth plane, which came down um, in Pennsylvania or was brought down by the passengers in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so, so there the symbolic value was really, uh, yeah, the decisive point. And um, with other attacks, one always has to kind of look at the ideology, look at the aims, look at the possibilities also, or the difficulties to, to attack certain uh, targets um, to be able to understand why targets are, um, yeah, certain targets are, are chosen. And um, same with the Mohammed um, caricatures, for example, and the attack on Charlie Hebdo in Paris, or yeah, there's there usually is a close link with the ideology, which explains the targets. I just one last remark. Mm -hmm. I think it's also when dealing with the change of political regimes in the democratic countries, the elected president is not such a set. Uh, um, I know such a, uh, a sacred figure as emperor in a way. Uh, so okay, so it's awful if say president is killed, but another will come with mm -hmm. election. So this the tactics is changing, so that uh, so the terrorists are trying to find some symbolic objects like World Trade Center, which is episode mm -hmm. of you know American way of life. Or, for instance, um, that was a horrible um, terror attack at the theater uh, in the early 2000s in, in Russia by the Chechen. But, and yeah. that was also a symbol of culture and entertainment yeah. and the way of life. I think that's very much uh, connected to, to the political situation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Although I'm not quite sure if, um, I mean, there's this nice quote even by Narodnaya, people from Narodnaya Volia themselves who basically commented on their, when Alexander II was uh, killed in the end in 1881, uh, there was this comment, well, um, all we have achieved is that there is now a, a three instead of a two. So Alexander the third instead of Alexander the second. So uh, and and no change really in 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 the system. So for them also it was um, true, and they recognized it that somebody else would just follow up if not kind of the whole dynasty was was killed. So um, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the impulse for such an intense discussion. Dear colleagues, we are ending the discussion of the first uh, speech and in a pause, we'll come back with Helena Rachers' um, uh, talk, uh, War Without Peace, Militarization of Russian Society, the impacts of war in Afghan and Chechen. Thank <laughs> you.
Dear colleagues, so we continue with our section and our next presenter is Helena Ratchev, Oxford University, War Without Peace. So the militarization of uh, Russian society is one of the outcomes of war in Afghanistan and Chechnya. Helena, the floor is yours. Helena, hi colleagues, it's a great honor for me to talk to you today. I love your conference. Uh, it's a, a privilege to make my presentation. This is based on my PhD uh, at Oxford University. It's work in progress still, but I wanted to share some uh, preliminary conclusions. Uh, I uh, focus on two military operations in Chechnya as the latest and the bloodiest conflicts in uh, uh, modern Russian history that have affected the country the most, uh, according to official information. Uh, 620 soldiers, uh, mostly conscripts, uh, passed through Afghanistan uh, during the decade of the war. More than, that's a huge amount of people. They came back, uh, they live across uh, various uh, cities of Russia. I met them and interviewed them in my presentation. I wanted to talk about uh, how the state discourse changed, uh, how these uh, wars uh, that were essentially lost uh, became uh, similar to the veterans of the Second World War, the Great World War. And I want to talk about how the state uh, started to use them as a political tool and a means of new military mobilization campaigns. Um, over the past two decades, uh, Russia conducted an unprecedented campaign of military modernization. The country doubled its defense budget. It reached 4% of the country's GDP. It increased uh, defense uh, industry and international arms trade, conducted a large-scale reform of the army. A, a recent Levanda Center a poll uh, indicated that 63% of the informants uh, consider army as uh, the most trustworthy institute and the president of Russia received only 60% of uh, uh, trust. Moreover, we all know that uh, every few years uh, Russia participated in various military campaigns in South Ossetia and Donbass and in Syria. In addition, which is perhaps less known from the outside, uh, Russia initiated uh, uh, patriotic mobilization campaign, creating a new discourse of military glory. For many years, the Great Patriotic War was the only officially celebrated war in the history of the Soviet Union, and its veterans were the only ones so recognized uh, uh, as veterans over, uh, under the Soviet military law. No other war participants so were granted the status. Uh, the next uh, great uh, war campaign in Afghanistan for a long time was so uh, hugely unpopular. Uh, its participants were not granted the status of uh, veterans. So it was looked down upon in 1991, according to a poll conducted by the Levada Center, 69% of the informants uh, called this war a crime against the state. Uh, uh, throughout the 90s, it was remembered as something shameful, uh, senseless, and something that ended in defeat. Uh, moreover, the society was fronted, frightened by the Afghan syndrome and the media coverage of the veterans uh, struggling with the post-traumatic uh, syndrome disorders. Uh, they were potentially coming back to the society, being uh, aggressive, and this uh, further stigmatized and marginalized them. One of my informants, uh, interviewees, uh, noted uh, that uh, when they returned uh, home, they were found themselves in complete social isolation. Uh, when he was walking down the street with his future wife, his friends would not approach her because they thought that he was aggressive and dangerous. Uh, but uh, in the 2000s, uh, the attitude to the Afghan war from the state started to change. Uh, a new state discourse uh, of the war in Afghanistan began to emerge. Uh, the state was starting to treat the Afghan war as this new big military campaign that uh, would be a continuation of the Great Patriotic War. The first uh, welcome speech or greeting speech uh, uh, from Putin uh, to mark the 11th anniversary of the withdrawal of the troops of, um, after a few months of, uh, from him coming to power contained all of the future themes of this future state discourse uh, and uh, I will make this read the long quote uh, which I think is very important the soldiers internationalists honestly uh, performed their duties on the Afghan soil, they were faithful to their oaths and fierce battles, uh, they showed merciless stamina and courage, they became famous uh, for their 
fighting spirit and courage uh, the feats of the heroes of the afghan war is timeless so we will always remember the fallen sons of russia and pay tribute to the afghan veterans uh, many of them are still in um, in military service today in the course of the anti-terrorist operations in the north caucasus uh, their experience and training helps us overcome the most critical situations uh, um, on the one hand, this is uh, similar to uh, normal military discourse. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this uh, quote uh, contains uh, new themes, uh, such uh, as the bonds of the Afghan Brotherhood. Uh, we know that uh, there was a lot of hazing uh, in the Afghan army. Um, but here he's talking about the courage of the soldiers, their loyalty to military service, and that was contrasted with the meaninglessness of the war itself. Uh, uh, there are allusions to modern anti-terrorist campaign, uh, putting compared the invasion of Afghanistan uh, with the fight against international terrorism, a political Islam. He kept talking about this war being just, uh, being necessary. Towards uh, the late 2010s, uh, this attitude uh, started uh, to change. People started to talk about uh, this war being just uh, required, uh, that nobody ever doubted the necessity of a military intervention, that uh, the Afghan population was uh, grateful to the Soviet soldiers, uh, and there were endless interviews so that started to emerge uh, with the Afghans. So they were talking about uh, life under about how the, the Afghan people were happy to, and welcomed the Soviet soldiers. Uh, in 2015, uh, uh, Putin meeting Afghan veterans. Uh, was starting to talk about uh, the fact that we need to fight against extremist organizations uh, that were fueled by the West. Uh, we continue to do that uh, the same way as we did in Afghanistan. Later, this uh, war started to be mentioned uh, in the context of uh, the Syrian war. And we can see that the rhetoric is uh, very similar some slogans uh, from uh, the Soviet newspapers uh, were now applied uh, to uh, military uh, in newspapers in the 2010s. Uh, at the same time, uh, Franz uh, Klintsevich, the head of the largest uh, Russian Union of Afghanistan veteran, launched a massive campaign to rehabilitate this war. He argued that the Soviet invasion uh, stopped uh, drug trafficking and international terrorism and that the Soviet Union uh, was the first one to take the blow of jihad uh, nurtured by the intelligence services of other uh, Western countries and primarily the United States. Uh, the head of the Union proposed to revise the 1989 resolution of the Congress uh, of the People's Deputies of the USSR, which condemned the war as a politically motivated and unjustified. It's talking about um, that uh, it, the end of uh, 2018, uh, his uh, proposal was officially approved by the State Duma. And then it was supposed to be uh, passed as a law, it wasn't ratified. Uh, but, uh, well, perhaps it was just a matter of time, or perhaps it was something that wasn't a, a political decision. By the end of uh, 2010, the so state media had finally returned to a war glorifying Soviet narrative. And that was happening at uh, the level of politics. Um, and uh, we can see that it had a significant impact on the public uh, opinions. The Levada Center uh, confirms this over the past 25 years. The number of respondents uh, who consider this war to be a state a crime has decreased uh, uh, from 69 to 44 percent, so one and a half uh, times, and the number of people justifying it had grown significantly. At the same time, the attitude to Afghan veterans has changed. At the beginning of the 20s, uh, they started to be included into the pantheon of real veterans, uh, previously just the veterans of the Second World War. Uh, 
they were given the legal veteran status and there were other political initiatives uh, that included them. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in 2004 on the Paklana Garar, where previously they only had uh, memorials to the great uh, patriotic war, a monument to the internationalist soldiers uh, was uh, established. Um, Uh, the same author who made uh, the largest monuments uh, and then in 2005 uh, the committee of uh, veterans of uh, the great patriotic war handed over to the afghans a uh, symbolic banner of victory as a symbol of uh, them being the successes uh, uh, Franz Kilskevich uh, declared uh, that uh, the Afghans uh, have finally got the, the well-deserved recognition. I suppose uh, that uh, there is a, a well-established state discourse so with uh, there is a hierarchy of uh, the veterans of the Great Patriotic War, the most honorable one, and uh, followed by other participants uh, of uh, military conflict. Uh, when uh, the states realized that there are not many veterans of the Great Patriotic War left uh, and you can't uh, get them out to visit schools, they, they started to engage uh, veterans uh, from Afghanistan and as one of the ex-Afghan warriors said, uh, well, we will be uh, superseded by the Chechen veterans. Uh, uh, since uh, the mid-2000s, uh, the states uh, also began to present two military campaign in Chechnya as part of the global fight against international terrorism and the soldiers were also declared heroes uh, uh, at the 2000s um, those that died in the initial uh, war collisions in Chechnya there was a, there was a huge festival to commemorate uh, the death and we realized that there were 65 monuments uh, to uh, those that perished uh, we have to say that uh, alongside this uh, discourse uh, coming about uh, the level of support uh, from veteran organization began to grow the state uh, started uh, to engage veteran unions uh, to create a new patriotic narrative uh, and an image of uh, heroic uh, Soviet struggle against international terrorism and the goals of the military unions coincided with the goals of the state. Uh, uh, both of them tried to restore respect uh, for the military and create a heroic image of a war, the soldiers of which were fulfilling the military duties. Uh, uh, for example, uh, France uh, uh, Klintsevich that we've mentioned uh, compared uh, the war in Afghanistan with the war in South Ossetia and then the war in Syria later. These campaigns were caused by the threats from uh, the global west uh, trying to weaken the Soviet Union. The movement of uh, veterans in Afghanistan began as a grassroots uh, a movement uh, uh, with various uh, small organizations, uh, with people trying to uh, support uh, ex-soldiers, uh, to get social benefits uh, from the state, uh, to get financing uh, from for the families of the deceased, or perhaps some uh, financing to uh, create monuments. Uh, but gradually, these small unions uh, were closed and they were replaced by the bigger ones. Uh, Uh, and uh, the Combat Brotherhood, uh, which is uh, headed by the ex-mayor uh, of the Moscow region, uh, Skromov. Uh, and uh, gradually they become uh, fully state-funded, uh, following state ideology, fulfilling state orders. Uh, since 2007, the majority of uh, a regional veterans organization was supported, uh, uh, supported the electoral campaigns. Uh, and once uh, the All Russian People's Front emerged, uh, these became uh, the first uh, to be supported um, by the deputies in 2011. Uh, the Covered Brotherhood, uh, the main goals of which uh, was uh, to create a system of participation and protecting the national interests of the state, uh, they started to promote uh, patriotism. Uh, 
and unification around a national idea. Starting from 2005, the union began to expand their field of activities and moved uh, to preparing young people to defend uh, the fatherland. Uh, this transition from a discourse of grief uh, to a discourse of fame was firmly established by early 2010s uh, when the status of all of the main unions were amended uh, and the main goal was now to uh, not protect the interests of the veterans first and foremost but to protect the national interests of Russia. This became the key obligation. Systematically ignoring this task uh, would lead uh, to veterans uh, being excluded uh, from the union. So if veterans refuse to go to schools and to participate uh, uh, in uh, this patriotic education of the youth uh, could be exposed and they could be, the benefits could be withdrawn uh, and they, they might be denied uh, support. So in uh, a little more than 10 years, uh, this organizations from protecting the rights of its members, they become a fully fledged uh, political institutions affiliated with the state. Uh, they became uh, uh, organizations that generate uh, uniform communicative norms uh, to tell a state story of the war. I wanted to talk about the tasks uh, that the members of these military unions are now charged with. Uh, there are three key tasks. Uh, of course, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the unions uh, you know, created this uh, uh, patriotic infrastructure. On an annual basis, these organizations uh, organize up to 3,000 military uh, patriotic events and activities uh, aimed at uh, uh, supporting the external and internal policies of the president uh, to combat destructive opposition. And this is a quote in the charters. In 2015, uh, they coordinated 10 uh, large scale public uh, activities. Uh, uh, for instance, um, to mark the first anniversary of the annexation of Crimea uh, and uh, every third member of the union out of 100,000 people took active part in uh, these uh, social political activities. Uh, since the early 2000s, uh, veterans uh, uh, have been actively engaged in this military patriotic education of school children, uh, promoting army propaganda. A few examples that I randomly selected, just looking at the recent news. So, uh, for instance, uh, they have a master class uh, on uh, putting together the Kalashnikov uh, weapon uh, in a hospital for kids, uh, or the border agents at Habarovsk, uh, the healthy eating festival in Tveria, uh, and helping younger uh, uh, criminals. Uh, to practice services. My favorite, uh, going down the Don River in Hecassia, where religious uh, officials and the military people uh, went down of uh, the uh, river with the icon of the Holy Godmother to revive the spiritual traditions uh, and uh, to participate in the patriotic education of the youth. Uh, there are many examples of such activities. Uh, there are a lot of the schools are engaged in this initiative uh, and the veterans of Afghanistan would complain that they're surrounded by schools and they only have uh, five people that have to go around the schools or make the rounds or go. It's like a, a new job for them every 9th of May, the victory day or the anniversaries of, for the beginning and the end of the war. So whenever they're invited, they have to go to school. It's an obligation and they have been complaining that it's an extra workload for them. Aside that, uh, I suspect that these play another function. Uh, they will unite uh, the veterans around uh, the state. Uh, they are now under the control of uh, the state. Uh, this is a, a sort of a psychological rehab uh, for uh, the veterans, which does not exist formally in Russia. The second role that I would want to talk about is directly related to war. With the start of the military campaigns in Donbass, uh, veteran organizations turned into uh, informal recruitment centers uh, for volunteers. Uh, uh, 
for instance, respondents from Yekaterinburg have said that the Sveriges Regional Public Fund for the Disabled and the Special Forces and another, a number of other local organizations, uh, starting from the beginning of the war in Donbass, uh, would phone uh, veterans of uh, local wars, uh, offering them assistance and sending them to Ukraine, uh, helping them to get arms, helping them to get uniforms. Uh, in 2019, uh, uh, one of the participants of the Chechen war was talking about uh, recruiting campaigns that hire people to be sent to Syria or to Africa. And the veterans uh, would call these centers uh, when they need a job or they would ask for vacancies or openings. Uh, and this is what they would be offered. Uh, the third task of these uh, military unions is uh, uh, participating in pro-government political activities after the end of the Russian-Georgian war in 2008 uh, in Vladikavkaz, uh, which is uh, the city closest uh, to the war activities. Uh, there was a huge meeting, Afghans against uh, the war, where the Georgian army uh, and its actions in the South Ossetia were condemned uh, and they appealed collectively uh, to the Georgian embassy with uh, demands uh, to stop the aggression in 2013 after the march of uh, millions, uh, which uh, started the uh, Bolotnia affair. The Russian Union of Veterans uh, held a rally at which it demanded criminal prosecution of the participants uh, of the march. There were lots of uh, meetings uh, on the annexation of, of, of Crimea, organized uh, across the entire Russia, from the biggest cities to the smallest ones, so like Novomoskovsk and Attila region, or um, staff in the Nizhny Novgorod. So all of this uh, led me to believe uh, that uh, these movements uh, have turned into like contractors uh, um, performing ideological orders of the state. And the last point that I wanted to uh, focus on is how the veterans themselves reacted to the changes in the public discourse uh, and how they took to the new role and the new tasks uh, uh, from the interviews uh, with the veterans uh, I gathered that uh, the support uh, for the new discourse uh, was partially uh, a response, a reaction to the negative attitudes towards them in the 1990s. Uh, veterans internalized uh, the Soviet state rhetoric about heroes uh, who have fulfilled the international duty. And after returning from the war, they expected to receive uh, the same level of respect uh, when the society refused to treat them as heroes and the state did not fulfill its obligation towards them. They really held a grudge and then they welcomed this uh, change in the rhetoric. Uh, this uh, public uh, condemnation, which made them feel like uh, they were exiled, uh, now turned around and uh, they started to feel this uh, positive attitude of the state, uh, which they welcomed uh, even after they came from back from the war. It's not the service uh, that uh, has the key, uh, plays the key role, it's uh, their loyalty to the state. There is another important detail, all of the respondents uh, that um, I talked to not only uh, talk about uh, the Afghanistan and the Chechen wars, uh, they continue the rhetoric further to Donbass and Syria, speaking about them as episodes of the same endless uh, struggle, both in the official uh, speeches uh, and in methodological instructions. Uh, this rhetoric of a never-ending war has become very noticeable over the last few years. When I was talking to one of the um, veterans uh, from Afghanistan, who regularly participates in these uh, educational campaigns at schools, I asked him, how do you explain how, what do you talk to, uh, to the skilled kids about? And he started to think about it. And what he said was, well, I come and I tell them, well, I've been to the war and you still will participate in your war. It's something that's in store for you in the future. So, well, thank you for your attention. Tatiana, Yelena, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Let's see if we have any uh, questions uh, from our uh, participants uh, or from our, our YouTube Hans or Ulrich, please. Okay. Um, just a brief question that was very, very interesting. I couldn't make anything out of your title. And all of a sudden, uh, I heard about a phenomenon that I've never seen. Now, 
I mean, I'm living in a country, I'm a citizen of a country that has an even larger military than Russia, the United States of America. And of course, you see from time to time veterans in the streets. But I mean, it would be, I think, completely unthinkable, at least in California, that any of those veterans would ever talk at a high school. Hence my question. Um, do you think that uh, in the first place, um, this is a kind of uniquely Russian type of institution? Yeah, I mean, to use, I mean, veterans, of course, exist. I mean, whoever has been in a war professionally, and even non-professionally, comes back as a veteran. But I mean, this this communities of veterans. I have an older son who was a lieutenant colonel in the German Air Force, and he once went to, to Russia for a visit with those, with those veterans, and he was completely flabbergasted. He didn't dislike it, but he said he'd never seen something like that. So that is the first question. Is this a uniquely, and I say deliberately, Russian type of institution? And then secondly, clearly, uh, I mean, given the great uh, patriotic war, and I say that without irony, being born in Germany, um, veterans had an important status in the Soviet Union. But uh, do you think that there are significant changes, structurally speaking, functionally speaking, between the status of veterans in the Soviet Union and between the status of veterans in present day uh, Russia? Elena. Yeah, thank you, Elena, thank you so much. Uh, very interesting questions. I tried to uh, find some literature on other countries and try to compare the situation in Russia with the uh, situations across other countries. But as far as I gathered, everywhere from uh, the US to Zimbabwe, uh, wherever there were um, military companies, so the situation is completely reversed. Uh, uh, veterans uh, that come back uh, to their countries, uh, they are in opposition to the state uh, and uh, they would form various groups uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, um, like political parties uh, or there was a recent book uh, that was published uh, on how Vietnam veterans that came back to the US uh, uh, founded uh, one of the Ku Klux Klan uh, sections and some political movements uh, that were opposed. In Russia, veterans uh, turned out to be a tool to the state uh, which I think is not typical. It's unique. I haven't seen that anywhere else. When we talk about uh, like uh, honoring the veterans, that's something that we can see elsewhere, but nothing of the kind. Perhaps I don't have the full picture, but from what I was able to read, I haven't seen this elsewhere. This phenomenon seems unique. Uh, in terms of the veteran status, uh, I think uh, it changed, of course. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the veterans were granted this uh, status much later than the end of the war. As we know, the first years after they came back, uh, they were not honored. Uh, they were not uh, re recognized uh, as uh, war heroes and veterans. Uh, and uh, it's curious how the initial military unions would be formed uh, during the Soviet times. Uh, the first uh, veteran unions uh, for World War II uh, were established in the West uh, and they needed to find uh, Soviet veterans that would participate in international unions uh, and uh, a single union was formed uh, in order specifically for these veterans to uh, make public speeches abroad, not uh, in the Soviet Union and uh, veterans were given the right uh, to unite uh, but this union was, was with no members, nobody could be a permanent member of the veteran union uh, and the very interesting archive uh, Mm, notes uh, from the first meetings uh, they were asking can we gather again can we bring our friends they were told no no guys uh, you go abroad you make the speech come back and no further actions required and they wanted more activities and as soon as they were able to they started to unite they started to organize uh, their own initiatives and uh, establish their own monuments uh, but uh, the status that they are in now it took them uh, uh, they were only able to get it uh, in the modern Russia previously they were like playing this uh, decorative function um, decorative purposes that were used uh, but in the current uh, format I think this is something that's uh, uh, came about recently in the last few years I'm not sure if I answered your question well thank you that's perfect and makes it even more interesting thank you Elena, we have questions from our YouTube viewers. So, do you see any differences uh, between 
uh, the, the memories of uh, the veterans in uh, Afghanistan and in Chechnya, Helena, yes, of course, and there are significant differences. Uh, the discourse of the Afghan war started to emerge earlier, and the key difference here in this war uh, is uh, that the Chechen war never had the status of the war. One of the wars uh, was uh, a political operation, the Second Chechen War, and the First Chechen War was called uh, something or other, but it wasn't a war. The war was not mentioned uh, in the official terminology. So soldiers that participated in these wars, they did not have the status of the veterans, uh, they had no social benefits, and uh, Afghan veterans were not really veterans. They had a different status, how they were treated differently, and there was some tension among the veterans. Uh, the Chechen well, veterans said that they're looking up to the Afghan heroes, um, whereby for the Afghans, uh, the Chechens, uh, uh, the Chechen soldiers are too young, uh, they haven't been to war for long enough, uh, and they treat them somehow with a lot of, well, they, they're condescending towards them in a way. And the status is also different, uh, seems like uh, the war in uh, Afghanistan was a real war and the Chechen war is not really accepted as a full-fledged war, the discourse is not fully established, but it's evolving and uh, going forward uh, this uh, will become more uh, formalized. It's interesting how this uh, attitude to the Chechen war as a heroic war is coming about, this is not something that we saw before and it's gaining momentum. And this entire memories of the Second Chechen War and the First Chechen War is built around the memories of uh, the Sixth Troop uh, and those that uh, perished in the initial stages of the war. When they talk about the Chechen War, they mostly talk about uh, uh, the soldiers that died in Chechnya. And in, in this sense, these are not like generic victims. These are perished heroes uh, that uh, we will keep in our memories forever. So this is like this tragical aspect to it. Uh, and in this sense, the Afghan and the Chechen wars are somewhat similar. Irina, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Uh, don't you think uh, that uh, the issues of the Chechen war, because it's a war within the country, it's there's some duality to it. It's a bit am ambiguous with the Afghan war. You can argue whether we should have entered Afghanistan or not, uh, but it's still a different country. And the drama of the Chechen war is in the fact uh, that there is some kind of schizophrenic uh, split in the state. On the one hand, Chechnya is not considered to be a part of Russia. Uh, practically, we sense that the way the discourse is organized. On the other hand, you can't say that uh, uh, we were fighting against Chechnya because it's an internal conflict. Uh, so I think that the drama of the veterans of the Second World War is that the status is very ambiguous. Yelena, that's a really pertinent uh, question and a very accurate way of looking at it, you'll be surprised, but the Chechen war is not an eternal war officially, it's a, a war with international terrorism and it's one of the first wars uh, followed by the uh, wars against uh, Islamic organizations uh, and ISIS uh, and the Chechen war was the first uh, in this whole series of anti-terrorist wars. Uh, the rhetoric uh, evolves around the fact uh, that uh, the Islam terrorists emerged uh, from somewhere and we fought them. There's no mention that this part of our own country. And I was absolutely astounded uh, by these events to commemorate uh, the 10th uh, anniversary of the death uh, of uh, the sixth troop uh, because where they died uh, close to in Chechnya, there were federal officials that made speeches and uh, Ramzan Kadyrov made a speech uh, and he he was talking about uh, the heroes that perished uh, and I checked uh, and it turned out that Kadyrov together with his father switched, he flipped, uh, uh, he switched uh, to the Russian official side uh, six months before they died uh, and uh, he was the one making a speech about terrorists uh, that came out of nowhere that uh, killed the Russian citizens uh, and it's nowhere mentioned uh, that we were fighting against our own. Uh, this is something that's mentioned only in reports uh, from Levada Center on the increase in the nas the nationalism uh, in, within Russia, this lack of tolerance towards uh, Chechens and uh, you know, Islam. Uh, after the Chechen war, this lack of tolerance uh, towards uh, Islam representatives, there was a huge spike. Uh, there was a lot of attacks on uh, the Chechens uh, not soldiers that fought in Chechnya, but ethnically Chechens uh, 
so clearly it was an internal conflict uh, and uh, it, it was a very acute conflict, but it's, this is not something that's part of the official rhetoric. Uh, they switched our attention uh, from this perception of a civil war to fighting against some mythical Islam terrorists. Tatiana Yelena, we have a question from uh, uh, Carola. Carola, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting talk on a very important topic, I find. Um, and maybe just as a first reaction, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, the first reaction is maybe an anecdotic reaction um, because looking from Germany, it's somehow, um, yeah, for, for Germans, in a way, it was lucky that 45 war ended for quite some time. And it was interesting for me to come to the United States um, or to come to Russia on the one hand in the 19th and, and early 1990s, uh, in 91, 92, and for the first time see veterans begging in the streets in, in St. Petersburg, a phenomenon I I just hadn't known. And on the other hand, coming to the United States in 2006 and um, yeah, having celebrations there such as Veterans Day and, and seeing the memorials for World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War um, and the veterans gathering there on, on Veterans Day and, and kind of recognizing for both societies that um, war had been continuous really after 45 also, uh, which wasn't something really, um, yeah, which wasn't the experience in Germany. And then this changed again with Bosnia. And Bosnia was really the first war again to produce veterans and, and German society still has trouble dealing with this in a way. There is, there is not, so institutions, everything had to be created, recreated. Um, and now kind of there, there is a, yeah, there are veterans again from Bosnia, from Afghanistan wars, from Iraq wars. Um, but, but this was really a phenomenon of, of the 2000s again. Um, so, so it's interesting to, to compare these perspectives, but this is just kind of the anecdotic. I, I just wanted to, um, to share. Um, the, my real question is that I remember, and I'm sorry, I'm very bad with titles right now, but I remember that from the 1990s, there was a very realistic, critical literature, and also from the 1980s, really, literature and films on the war of Afghanistan and also the Chechnya war. And I was ex in Russia and I was extremely impressed by that. I, I read some of these books. I, um, I don't remember titles anymore. I'm sorry, something with Red Sun and, and films which had taken up 19th century text, but um, put it on Chechnya um, um, pictures. I remember them be very impressive. And I wonder, and that's my first question, what happened to this literature and film and, and, and cultural representations? Are they still present in any way or have they basically, um, yeah, are they, are they out of, of, of the reception right now? That's my first question. The second question I would be interested in is um, in how for this 19th century campaigns in, in the Caucasus are still remembered, come in into this remembrance. Are they present in any way? Um, uh, figures like Shamil and the, the Russian campaign in the mid 19th centuries, are they present in any way? Or is that something which, which are two different um, stories basically? Thank you so much. Uh, Elena, thank you so much for your questions. They're incredibly interesting. You mentioned the film uh, from 1991, Nikita Tsiga, uh, an amazing film. In fact, I don't remember which uh, novel from the 19th century it was based on about somebody who loses his leg in Chechnya, and then he thinks that uh, this leg make, uh, uh, performs uh, crimes instead of him. Uh, it, it became unnoticed, uh, it, unfortunately. It's great that you remember it, uh, but uh, not many remember it here. 
and I asked a lot of veterans uh, from Afghan and from Chechnya whether they remember any books or films about the war. Is there anything that uh, they consider truthful and important? Uh, but as a rule, they all said that no, and nobody understands our experience. Uh, all of these uh, facade parade films with a lot of shooting and huge budgets, they know it's not about them, uh, but films like uh, The Leg, uh, I guess they are too gloomy, too traumatic, and they try to disassociate from that as well. Uh, the one film that they mentioned uh, uh, is uh, uh, one film from the 90s, uh, The Afghan war. I think uh, it also distorted the, the, the war a little bit, in my opinion, but uh, they stood by it and they thought it was a bit really truthful in representing the war. I think there was um, a lot of films that went unnoticed, uh, they were forgotten. And then after a while, these uh, new parades, uh, so to say, official films uh, started to emerge. Uh, and. Uh, well, they don't really resonate uh, with the veterans or the society, in fact. Uh, uh, there is a sort of a lacuna uh, in, 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 in um, social consciousness. Uh, sometimes it's a scandal when a new film comes out. Uh, uh, there, there was a recent film uh, that caused a huge scandal because the Afghan veterans said that it wasn't about them, uh, that it has nothing to do with the experience, uh, and uh, that uh, it's a very dark way of representing the war, but there is no single film that would be a cultural phenomenon uh, and that would resonate with the veterans. I don't think that exists. Uh, unfortunately, it is in fact a gap in the cultural context uh, that's not filled yet. Uh, now, talking about uh, Caucasus campaigns of uh, the mid uh, 19th century, they're not part of the discourse. So I haven't thought about it before, but I think the reason is that we can't remember Shamil because we can't consider the Chechen wars as a continuation of a struggle against Shamil because well, we're talking about not fighting our own citizens, we're talking about international terrorism and Shamil has nothing to do with that. Uh, if we continue to fight against the Caucasus representatives that we've been fighting against uh, for many centuries, why haven't we won yet? Uh, where is the victory? Why are we killing our own citizens? Uh, so these campaigns don't fit in uh, uh, or it's something like mythic like uh, well, the Vladimir campaigns from way back, it's, it's, and essentially nothing except the Second World War was part of this official discourse, uh, that was the ice battle, um, and then uh, there was uh, this uh, huge founding concept of uh, the Great Patriotic War and everything that follows after. The Caucasus wars are not part of uh, this uh, cultural perception. They're not part of this pyramid uh, constructed, uh, um, and, and it shouldn't be. Uh, Irina, in terms of the books, uh, like the, the Tink Boys by Svetlana Alexievich, uh, this uh, book uh, is uh, still well known. Uh, it's not part of the official discourse, of course. Uh, but uh, because Alexievich uh, has this uh, Boys in Tink, uh, uh, this book uh, keeps being uh, republished. Uh, uh, this anthropology of war uh, penned by Alexander Alexievich is, is there, although it's not the mainstream narrative. Uh, Boys in Zinc, yes, that's a perfect example. And there were other authors as well that wrote about uh, uh, the, the war. But I, I have this feeling that uh, they're not really in demand by the state. Uh, you can't build a mythology based on Alexievich's text, it's impossible. And the veterans themselves wouldn't read these books. Uh, a curious uh, and strange uh, uh, response I got when I asked about Alexievich, uh, they kept saying that, well, several people said the same thing. I haven't read Alexievich, uh, but I know that uh, she uh, talks bad about Russia. Uh, she represents it uh, in an unfavorable light. Uh, so everybody has this perception. Uh, and after she got the Nobel Prize of, well, uh, people made these conclusions and they never opened the book, uh, but uh, they have their opinions. Uh, and um, uh, they, were, they were talking about Shalamov, talking about, about the Soviet uh, uh, reality and Alexievich was similar. I mean, that is typical. It's typical. This is something that people, uh, do respond to in the same way. Perhaps I missed this, uh, but um, 
it's interesting that uh, this uh, whole perception of the Afghan history started uh, with the union of uh, soldiers' mothers, uh, this organization that came about at the end of the 80s. The mothers of uh, the soldiers that died in Afghanistan uh, uh, created the social organization, and the goal was uh, to cherish the memories of those that died. Uh, and uh, against the crime of the war that killed their sons uh, and they played one of the key roles uh, in the revolution 1991 uh, in august they were all there on the barricades uh, and uh, for a long time they were uh, a force to be reckoned with uh, and then after well they se seem to continue to exist uh, but they're not a real organization anymore even because they were really oppressed and uh, the leadership uh, was uh, overtaken and it all started as women against war the movement uh, and this is what Yelena was talking about and uh, we get into to this typical soviet indoctrination i remember when i was at school we had veterans come to us and now i suspect that these were probably suspicious smearish people like not really veterans they kept talking about uh, endlessly about uh, the great uh, patriotic wars so all of the tools uh, of the soviet propaganda is now adopted uh, by the current situation the current uh, state Yelena, uh, thank you uh it's very interesting that you mentioned these uh, uh, female organizations not even mothers but wives as well in one of the cities i found a union of uh, the wives of the soldiers that died in afghanistan i tried to uh, reach out to them and I talked to the deputy of the local Duma, who was part of the military union. She, she gave me a phone number of this lady and she said, well, yes, uh, the, the, the widows of uh, the soldiers that died, uh, they gather in our office. Uh, we give them um, uh, some support to organize some, well, not celebrations, uh, but gatherings. Uh, and she was very frightened, this lady. She refused to talk to me. I told her that uh, well, I was calling from the local deputy, then she called the deputy, she confirmed my identity, she confirmed that I was who I was saying I was, and she agreed to talk to me. And then uh, she was very open, uh, she really told me that she was uh, grateful to the local deputy for his help uh, to their organization. And I was like horrified uh, because, uh, well, these Afghan mothers and, 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 and wives and, and the they don't seem to be aware of uh, what was actually underlying all of these uh, uh, movements. There's another interesting story that has to do with uh, the role of uh, the wives uh, and the mothers uh, of the Chechen soldiers, as far as I know. The basis of the discourse for the first Chechen war is based on this movement uh, of uh, soldiers' mothers. So if you look at all the newspapers uh, from the first uh, Chechen war, the basis of this discourse uh, are the boys that died uh, with guns in their hands uh, and these uh, innocent uh, young soldiers uh, and that came from the mothers going to Chechnya they were talking uh, this was all heavily covered and the memories of the first uh, Chechen war is the memory of uh, these young kids that died uh, this new recruits uh, I don't remember one of the deputies back in the day called them this uh, um, green recruits uh, and th this is the memory that stayed um, and uh, even the current state discourse uh, cannot appropriate this uh, and it seems like that there's a global war in Chechnya uh, with the the sixth troop uh, uh, but the first uh, war is uh, somewhere there on the periphery with uh, this uh, very tragic uh, narrative about uh, the young soldiers that died and their mothers uh, uh, that were mourning them uh, in Chechnya and there is nothing you can do from that uh, to transform it uh, into a state uh, ideology and this movement of the Chechen mothers is sort of stands apart still and uh, it still has an impact on the m memory of the war and there is nothing that you can do to overturn that uh, there was nothing similar with the second uh, Chechen war there was a very rigid censorship uh, and uh, there were no mothers uh, going to Chechnya. It was mostly uh, not conscription army. It was professional. Uh, so, the, Tatiana, we have lots more questions uh, for you, Yelena. But uh, well, we are out of uh, time a little bit. So, uh, thank you so much uh, for the discussion. And uh, in uh, just a minute, uh, we'll be back uh, for a presentation by 
Laurie Manchester from the University of Arizona, how the uh, Gulag had a, an impact uh, uh, on the Manchurian Russians, a comparison of the narratives of forced and unforced repatriates uh, to the USSR from Manchuria. <laughs> Uh, dear colleagues, so we're continuing with uh, our section, uh, Laurie Manchester, how the Gulag uh, impacted Manchurian Russians, uh, a comparison of forced and voluntary uh, migrants from Manchuria to the USSR. Laurie, please, the floor is yours. Laurie, you're muted. We can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. can, can yes, we can. can. Yes. Terrific. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start my story with 1945, uh, with victory in uh, World War II, uh, when Soviet soldiers uh, liberated Manchuria from the Japanese occupation. In Manchuria at that time, uh, specifically in its capital, Harbin, the largest Russian emigre diaspora in the world existed. With these soldiers coming into Harbin, as you see in this photograph, you see emigres uh, warmly embracing them. Laurie, we can't see the presentation. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Yes, terrific. Okay, so if you see in the photograph to the right, you see um, emigres warmly greeting Soviet soldiers. Um, during World War II, uh, many Russian emigres in, in Manchuria who had been previously anti-Soviet embraced the Soviet Union. Any distinctions that they had felt between uh, Russia, that of Imperial Russia, which many had fought to protect in the Civil War, and the USSR, uh, those distinctions evaporated and they collapsed their notions of these two different Russias into one Russia. Uh, and thus, uh, they greeted the Soviet soldiers as their Russian uh, brothers. However, within a couple of months after uh, this warm reunion, approximately 10,000 Manchurian Russians were uh, seized uh, by uh, Shmersh. Uh, some were executed, most were sent to the Gulag. Most of them were men who had voluntarily or involuntarily worked for the Japanese during the Japanese occupation. Um, all emigre leaders uh, were, were seized and those who had worked in anti-communist organizations uh, while they were in China. What then happened was the Sovietization of Manchuria. So all Russian schools, uh, and there were more Russian schools in Manchuria than anywhere in the world, uh, became Soviet schools. Uh, the emigre press was disbanded um, and uh, contact with the outside world uh, to some extent ceased uh, as Manchuria became a somewhat closed uh, society under Soviet uh, influence. Now the relatives of those whose husbands, brothers, um, 
fathers had been seized in 1945, went to the Soviet consulate, asked what had happened uh, to their loved ones, and were told that they had absolutely no information. Uh, some women remarried, not knowing anything about their husbands. It wasn't until 1952 uh, that uh, those who had survived started to be able to send out notes, uh, letting their families know they were alive. Um, Many of the Manchurian men who went to the Gulag survived um, and they were released in 1956. Now, despite this massive wave of terror uh, that gripped Manchuria uh, in 1945, in 1954, when Manchurian Russians were given the first opportunity to repatriate uh, to their historic homeland since 1935, when approximately 20,000 had repatriated and the vast majority of those were executed or arrested. So in 1954, when they were told that they could voluntarily go home, uh, the majority did. Okay, so this is a paradox in terms of this great terror that happened, and then you have um, 100,000 returning mainly in between 54 and 55. So there's a lot of different reasons for why they repatriated, and you can see a family there uh, leaving at the train station in the photograph. Um, and it's usually a combination of some of these reasons. It's usually not just one reason. So family reunification, right? If you knew that your father or brother or, or husband was in the Soviet Union, had got out of the gulag, that was one reason. Also, some families after World War II reconnected with their family members who had stayed in Russia um, after 1917. Second, it was much easier to repatriate than it was to migrate to capitalist countries, although some did. Uh, third, the Sovietization of Manchuria had led to the youth becoming, uh, for the most part, very pro-Soviet. There was a Komsomol-like organization in Manchuria that most joined. And in many families, uh, once 1954, it was announced that they could return. Some young people said, I'll return without you. I will uh, get my passport when I'm 16 and leave. And so that was a reason that some older family members who were more reluctant to repatriate, repatriated. Fourth, um, many Manchurian Russians were encouraged by changes they knew that had happened during the war. They had heard about the patriarchate being restored, about churches being opened, and they were especially um, they were interested in the uh, Soviet officers with their epithets on their uniforms, which reminded them of czar's uniforms. Uh, fifth, after Stalin's death, some older people felt like it was safe to go, although we do know that many, uh, not many, but some who repatriated did fear they would be arrested. Also, after uh, the Chinese revolution in 1949, the Chinese definitely uh, wanted them to leave. Uh, the Cultural Revolution doesn't start for several more years, um, but Russians were aware that they were no longer the cultural elite. Uh, in 1952, the Chinese language starts being used in higher educational institutions. And so um, many Russians felt that the only Whereas in Manchuria, they could live, they lived without knowing any language but Russian. They felt like the only place where they could go, uh, where they could live in an entire Russian speaking environment was the Soviet Union. So what this paper does is it compares narratives of these forced and unforced repatriates, asking how they define home and how the gulag affected uh, forced repatriates notion of home. Now, I should emphasize that these unforced repatriates um, were not repressed, those who leave in 54, although they did go through intense cultural shock, as often happens with ethnic matern, my, my, matern, return migration. Uh, the problem was, if we compare ethnic return migration, say, to uh, uh, colonial countries after uh, the decolonization in Africa and Asia, is that the Soviet state never ex explained to locals uh, why these uh, Russians from China were showing up. And this, this led to a great deal of confusion and, and um, 
hampered their acculturation into Soviet society. Um, we see a photo of the a family here. Uh, they were sent to state farms um, in 1954 and 55, and so they had harsh living conditions at first. That didn't help either. So what we see these Harbinsi doing, the voluntary Harbinsi, they engage in chain migration. They tend to uh, leave the state farms for specific cities in the Urals and Siberia. They help each other a great deal and become a diaspora in their historic homeland, of course, completely unofficially in the Soviet period. Now, if we turn to uh, forced repatriates, um, we see that they also helped each other in the gulag. At times, they were kept together in the gulag. Even uh, brigades were made up exclusively, in some cases, of Karbinsi. Um, now, when they got out of the gulag, uh, they were uh, in Astransi. They were foreigners, uh, and they had been foreigners throughout the time in the Gulag, with the I for foreigner on their on their um, uh, uh, on their uh, uniforms. Uh, so when they got out of the Gulag, uh, they were all asked uh, where they wanted to go. Now, uh, some knew that their families had emigrated to capitalist countries or were still in China, and they wanted to go to their families, but they were afraid to do so. They were afraid that it would lead to them being arrested again. Um, some did say that they wanted to go to Australia or China and were allowed to do so. It was very few. Uh, some were refused going to these countries, but continued throughout the Soviet period to um, apply to emigrate and were allowed uh, out in the 1970s. But the vast majority of them took Soviet citizenship, and for some of them, they already knew that their families had repatriated in 54 and that they were rejoining them. Uh, here is a picture of a uh, man who survived the gulag, uh, reunified with his wife. Now, uh, those who were unmarried, uh, who, the unmarried forced repatriates who had been taken when they were young, um, often ended up marrying Harbinki, who had come voluntarily. And through this, they joined the Harbinsi uh, diaspora, which they probably would have joined anyways, since uh, those who were forced repatriates very actively uh, sought any of the friends that they had had in Harbin uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, in interviews that I did before uh, that generation passed away, when I interviewed forced uh, repatriates, they would say their closest friends were, were Harbinsi, uh, who had also been incarcerated. Uh, next, the next category would be Harbinsi, and then the last category would be locals. Um, but some unforced repatriates avoided them uh, out of fear uh, and did not want to uh, socialize with them. One wife uh, who had repatriated with her two children in 1954 when she went to uh, get her husband from the Gulag in 56, uh, she was so shocked by his physical condition. She herself had been having a very difficult time those two years in the Soviet Union that at first she refused to unite with her husband. She refused to take him because he was an invalid and she did not think that he would be able to work. Now, most forced repatriates, uh, not surprisingly, um, were anti-Soviet. Um, and they have a different relationship in the Soviet period to Harbin and to their emigre past in China. Uh, they're able to do this because there were basically, especially in the minds of the forced repatriates, two different Harbins. There was the Harbin of pre-revolutionary uh, Russia, which is how they saw pre-1945 Harbin, which of course it was not exactly pre-revolutionary Russia, but that's how they saw it. And then there was Soviet Harbin after 1945. Now, forced repatriates were never in Soviet Harbin. They were taken in 45. And so all of their memories, all of their nostalgia is for this Harbin that existed before 45. Now, that's not the case uh, for those who were, um, who were voluntary repatriates. Um, for voluntary repatriates, uh, there's one Harbin and it is all mixed together. Um, now, whereas uh, forced repatriates did not try to become Sovietske Ludi, Soviet people, uh, those who uh, repatriated voluntarily, um, many of them did. 
They uh, had repatriated uh, some of them as great patriots because of the war, and they tried uh, to fit into the society, and the Sovietization of Harbin uh, helped them. The wife that I just spoke of, who didn't want to initially take her husband from the gulag, one of her husband's greatest complaints, and he wrote to his friends uh, who were Harbinsi from the gulag uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s, was that his wife didn't even remember Harbin. It was like she'd completely forgotten it. He found the address uh, of her uh, godmother in Australia, and she didn't even want to write to her. So for him, Harbin was sacred, it was nostalgic, and for her, at least in the Soviet period, it was not um, as important. So home for the post repatriates is definitely pre-1945 Harbin. For um, the voluntary repatriates, it's to some extent for, for many of them, the Soviet Union. Um, now, when I say that most forced repatriates did not feel the Soviet Union was their home, it's tricky because there's always this eternal Russia that exists. And so when they visit places like the photograph in St. Petersburg there, or when they go to the Kremlin, they feel that there is the eternal Russia that their families had left before 1917 or during the Civil War. Now, uh, at the, on the other hand, if we look at the genre of gulag memoirs and we look at how Harbinsi write about the gulag versus local Russians who were in the gulag, uh, local Russians tend to start their story with the gulag, and it might their memoirs might only be about the gulag, it might be after the gulag as well. For Harbinsi memoirs, always half the memoir is about Harbin, the other half is about the gulag, and that's because they're trying to present an alternative Russian that Harbin of pre-1945. Uh, one forced repatriate uh, from Harbin wrote in 1975, um, of course, uh, in Samizdat, that his views of Russia were superior to those of Solzhenitsyn because Solzhenitsyn had never lived in pre-revolutionary Russia, uh, whereas he, uh, born after 1917, had grown up in Harbin. In 1988, uh, in a letter written to a fellow forced repatriate, one Harbinitz who was also a forced repatriate wrote, my tragedy is that I still haven't felt that I have returned home. Yet it is in these places uh, of, of eternal Russia, these pre-revolutionary cities, monuments, churches, that they feel that they there are kernels of pre-revolutionary Russia waiting uh, to be uh, reawoken. Now, in, in writing in, to each other, the forced repatriates in the Soviet period, they uh, call the USSR things like this country, the country of our fathers, uh, but they do not refer to it as Russia, uh, and they do not refer to it as home. Now, both types of repatriates wanted uh, to uh, serve Russia, whatever they called it, and its peoples. Um, in interviews, uh, and I've done over a hundred, um, and in texts that forced and unforced have written, they go on and on about how much uh, they and their fellow repatriates contributed to bettering Russia through their works, right? Uh, in interviews, they show me their medals uh, that they were able to achieve. Um, now, uh, I think it's important to point out uh, that this, uh, this tradition uh, is based on the fact that in uh, the 1930s in Emigre uh, Harbin, they were brought up that their mission was to return to a Bolshevik free Russia and, uh, and rebuild it. Um, and for, the, for the, uh, the voluntary repatriates, it was to return uh, to a war-torn Russia, uh, since they no longer thought about the Bolsheviks during World War II. Um, and here, I, I don't have time to read it, but here is a poem that was written in 1955 uh, by a man who had just been released from the Gulag, in which he talks about his desire uh, to, to help his people and uh, to be able to be home and to live in Russia. Now, after 1991, however, forced Harbinsi finally feel like they have come home, right? Uh, and we see here uh, to the to the right uh, scout organizations, which a number of them who had been scout leaders um, helped to rebuild in post-Soviet Russia. So there's an odd um, phenomenon going on here, which is that on the one hand, 
uh, they are um, they are very excited that Russia is Russia again. But on the other hand, they want to model post-Soviet Russia on pre-revolutionary Russia, which means pre-1945 Harbin. So their nostalgia, their um, preoccupation with Harbin um, continues to exist. At the same time, unforced repatriates who to some extent had been home in Soviet Russia no longer feel at home in post-Soviet Russia. Uh, for, uh, for many unforced repatriates, right, their socioeconomic status drops in the 1990s, some lose their jobs, and these are people, many had achieved uh, professional success, had graduated from higher educational institutions, some had joined the party. So for those who felt that the USSR was their home, post-Soviet Russia is not their home. So they're looking for an alternative home, so they look back to Harbin. So uh, for uh, the, the repatriates, the forced repatriates and the unforced repatriates become united uh, for the first time over this idea that Harbin uh, is home. And again, I don't have time to read them, but these are quotes to the right uh, showing uh, a Harbinka uh, writing in 1988 and then in 1990 to a friend of hers from Harbin. Uh, and in the first quote from 1988, when she talks about we, she means we Soviet people. Two years later, uh, she's talking about we, and she means Harbinsi, and she's opposing Harbinsi uh, to local Soviets. Again, this idea of Harbinsi um, identity being very much in vogue because the Soviet identity is now disappearing. There is, however, um, a major issue of contention that exists in the 1990s between forced and unforced repatriates, and that is how they should remember 1945, right? Should they celebrate it as this reunion with their brothers from Russia? Or should they celebrate it as this, uh, as this great uh, uh, reunion? Or should they mourn it as this time when mass terror came in and their community was torn apart and pre-revolutionary Russia ceased existing? The repatriate press uh, uh, blossoms in post-Soviet Russia, lots of newsletters, journals, and in letters to the editors, uh, you see letters from forced repatriates saying you're not writing enough about the terror in 1945, stop writing about how it was a good year for Harbinsi, it wasn't. And on the other hand, you have unforced repatriates saying, why do you write about the terror? You should write about this wonderful issue, this wonderful reunion, and just about that. Now, some unforced repatriates are under the sway of what I would say is the cult of World War II uh, today in Russia. Uh, the only time I was ever asked to turn off my recorder during an interview was when um, a Harbinka started to talk about how soldiers had been swearing and that was how she learned swear words and she thought that that was such an affront to uh, to uh, World War II soldiers so she didn't want it officially recorded. Um, many uh, Harbinsi feel guilty, unforced, uh, because they sat out the war and they were made to feel guilty during the Soviet period and still to this day feel uh, in, in uncomfortable for that. But what is really striking is I have found a few forced repatriates who write that uh, it was only after being in the gulag that they feel that they had the right to call themselves Russians because they had not suffered uh, during the war. But that's a minority point of view. Now, lastly, uh, my last slide, uh, both groups attribute their survival or success to their upbringing in Harbin. So forced repatriates, when they write about the Gulag, they write that the only way they got through it was because of the morality that had been instilled in them uh, in, in Harbin, the industriousness, the love of their families, pre-revolutionary values. Now, um, unforced repatriates, um, uh, they write about how their success at work was because uh, they did not, like others, they, they, local Russians, they did not steal, they worked harder. Again, all of these values instilled in them in Harbin. And I'll just sum these up by quoting uh, a quote from a unforced repatriate in 1994. She was born in Harbin in 32. And this quote is typical of pretty much any Harbinets. Uh, in, she quote, my parents preserved the way of life, morals, and attitudes of pre-revolutionary Russia. They inculcated in us such traits as practical mindedness, steadfastness, decency, responsibility, 
humanity, industriousness, and lack of coddling. Um, these values are the opposite of what repatriates associate with local or Soviet Russians. Now, by the turn of the century, so this century, uh, and at this point, um, you know, there are, there were still in 2000, uh, some forced repatriates still alive. When the repatriate press writes about 1945, they always now write about it as a year of joy and sorrow. Um, as I've said, they've managed to unify because they now both feel that Harbin uh, was their home. Now, a division existed in the Soviet period, um, but the Harbin diaspora still united them within the Soviet Union. Uh, they both served Russia or the Soviet Union, depending on what they called it. Um, and uh, that was because of the nationalism that was instilled in them in Harbin, um, but a nationalism uh, that uh, as we've seen, uh, can often lead to violence. And uh, the uh, unforced repatriates from Harbin are, are sort of an extreme example of, of what people will do uh, to live in one's historic homeland. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Laurie, thank you so much uh, for such an inspiring reflection, uh, for such an inspiring uh, research. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, please go ahead, uh, ask your questions, uh, make your comments. Unfortunately, we're limited uh, in time. We only have 15 minutes uh, for the discussion. Irina, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. It's it's really inspiring, very interesting. You know, I, it's, I don't know whether it's a question uh, in a way. Uh, I was very much um, intrigued by this a kind of diaspora, uh, the Harbin's diaspora, uh, of course, non-officially, but really existing. You know, in my youth, I met a number of people from so-called American diaspora, diaspora. So mm -hmm. the, the children of the Americans coming in the thirties, either being communists, you know, idolizing, to, or just coming to work. Uh, and staying, uh, many of them were oppressed, so in a way. And I wonder, I think, is it possible to write a history, in a way, of such non-official diasporas within the Soviet Union, which I think, you know, and comparing their values and their illusions, this historical home, this um, split in their identity, I think that's uh, it's a very interesting topic. and. Um, I'm sure uh, we could create a totally different picture of the post-war Soviet societies. Yeah, I mean, my, uh, I'm writing a book about these repatriates, and precisely my interest, though, in them is that they're coming from the Russian emigration, in that I see them as um, a perfect way to study the encounter between vestiges of Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. And then in post-Soviet Russia, it's a way of getting at attitudes towards is the Soviet past and the pre-revolutionary past and sort of the tension between the two. So I have in my work, I've been interested, there were very few compared to the, the mass uh, repatriation was from China, over 100,000. Um, and if you, if there were three waves from China, so altogether it's like 160,000. From France or from Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, you have a few thousand, but uh, who, who come right after the war. So in my interviews, you know, I was always asking repatriates, like, did you ever meet anybody from who was also a repatriate from these European countries? Um, a few did, and you can also see that in their letters, and I've collected thousands of their letters. Um, and so friendships developed, a couple marriages did develop, uh, both in Central Asia. But generally, the Harbinsi within the global diaspora of the Russian diaspora, repatriates from China are separate. Uh, and they remain, they remain separate in Australia, San Francisco, uh, to this day. Um, and it's, it's an interesting um, question of why, but one of the reasons is because Harbin was the closest replica of pre-revolutionary Russia. So there was less assimilation. I, I think it also has something to do with them being in China and being looked down upon to some degree by those who were in the European diaspora and see it as more culturally um, advanced. Um, 
So, but I agree with you completely that I think that an unofficial history of the Soviet Union can be written. And, and that was why for me, it was so important to collect as many letters as I could that were written in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and also a way to get the voices of the older generation because they were the least Sovietized. Um, and so it was, you know, and, and some of them had lived in pre-revolutionary Russia, right? They had even been adults when they left. And so this encounter, um, their return uh, is, is, is simply fascinating as to, to what they recognize, what they accept uh, and what they do not accept. And so I think it's, it's a way of sort of getting at, at Russian versus Soviet. Um, Lori, thank you so much. Uh, while we're waiting for questions uh, from YouTube. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, my wife would say that's very untypical that I'm muted. She is making fun of me, making fun of me. That I'm supposed to listen all morning and cannot speak myself. So, <laughs> um, I think, uh, Laurie, you're in Arizona, right? I, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. So we we are both here from the American West Coast. So we are shortcut. Um, very short question, and that question has to do with the previous um, presentations. Um, mm -hmm. Could one say I'm now focusing on the post? I mean, post Soviet Union, so post eighty nine, post ninety situation, which mm -hmm. was only a small part of your. Um, presentation, but of course, a point of convergence with the previous uh, uh, lectures. Now, could one say that the way that, so now we would say Putin Russia, but present day Russia uh, manages uh, continuity with Russian history, with the past is by using institutions, institutional structures that were created in the Soviet Union and filling them up with certain mythologies or mythologies, whatever, concepts of eternal Russia. Now, if one could say that, I mean, that is my impression. Of two hours ago, I wouldn't even have been able to think about that. But now with the three presentations, I can formulate that hypothesis. That is my first question. Would this formula more or less work? So you use institutions, you know, veterans institutions and so forth, creating the Soviet Union, you leave them, you revive them. But um, you fill them up with a more neutral mythological type of eternal Russia. And that is the second question. I mean, it is not, in, in my knowledge, I mean, very, very scarce knowledge, as if the eternal Russia had not been a mythological horizon activated by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union used that too, no doubt about it. But that is my second and more specific question. Do you have any any impression on how the status and the use, the pragmatic use of eternal Russia, whatever exactly that would be, but we all have a concept of that, changed between the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union present day Russia. Yes. And thank you for the talk. Oh, thank you very much, my pleasure. So in the Soviet period, uh, in the post-war period, and very much starting in the 1950s, um, when there was this move, uh, to get as many DPs, as many POWs to repatriate and return to Russia. All of these various uh, institutions were set up for the um, right? And, and you, had, uh, you had magazines, glossy magazines for Russians abroad called Rodina, and you had Soviet clubs that officially existed in, in Australia, South America. So those institutions were there and they presented a rosy picture of the Soviet Union and a bridge to emigres as a way to keep uh, emigres or, or turn some emigres pro-Soviet because the Soviet Union always saw emigres as a threat, uh, even when I think the rest of the world wouldn't have seen them as a threat, but the Soviet Union always did. And it's one of the reasons I think they allowed the massive repatriation was a way to try to destroy the emigration and in part it did. But through these institutions, they, they tried to affect the views of emigres and to get some to return home. And those institutions existed right through Glossens and Perestroika and some simply morphed, maybe changed their name, maybe didn't change their name after 1991. So in 1993, there's a major um, uh, 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 
the Conference of Emigres in St. Petersburg, uh, where they invite them from all over the world. And of course, this has led to investment in, uh, in post-Soviet Russia. Uh, this has led to, uh, it helps their foreign policy, right? They, they very much, since the fall of the Soviet Union, they see emigres abroad as representatives of Russia. So there's there's all these book series that come out. You may have seen some of them, you know, like, you know, uh, Russians in China, Russians in Australia. But the weirdest ones is when you have like Russians in India, right? And it's about the first wave immigration when there were maybe 50 Russians in India, right? And <laughs> often when, when, when you read, and they have them for all the, these countries, and, and there are lots of different series, and when you read the, um, often they'll have a preface by the foreign minister. And the preface will talk about the important role that these first wave emigres, who of course were completely anti-Soviet, played in, 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 in being a bridge between Russia and, and that particular country. So they're hoping that, that in countries that have lots of Russians, like say the United States from various waves, that Russians will write letters to their congressmen, their senators to try to, to help foreign policy. So there is that continuity. Second question about internal Russia. Um, so the last chapter of my book is about representations of repatriates mm -hmm. in post-Soviet Russia. Uh, Putin has been very interested in uh, promoting a cult of the first wave, right? So uh, Denikin was reburied um, uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, Putin went to Putin's grave. Um, but um, so from, from the point of view of the, the Russian state and Russian statesmen, the first wave, um, as long as the leaders that they are encouraging uh, were pro-Soviet during World War II, so say Wrangel, who had died before World War II, so we don't know what he would have said during World War II, he is not celebrated. But Denikin lived through World War II. He embraced the Soviet Union. So it's a matter of, of, of what their politics were. And if it comes okay. to World War II, that's, that's, very, that's very tricky. But among locals, I just want to say quickly, um, they're very divided on how they feel about repatriates. Um, and I think this is because Russian national identity right now uh, is so... Um, is, is so uh, conflicted and so fragile. And so you have some who worship repatriates, see them as the real Russians because they see them as representing pre-revolutionary Russia. Others see them because they were not born in the Soviet Union, they're foreigners. So they're a very tricky subject, um, I think, and in part because of this connection to eternal Russia. And for some uh, people who grew up in the Soviet Union, they can't reject the Soviet experience from their notion of Russianness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laurie, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, I guess if um, are there are no further comments or, or questions, uh, uh, we are going to move on to the next uh, presentation. Irina, you wanted to say something. Uh, do we still have time uh, for one question? Uh, uh, okay, Just one minute. You know, just my ideas about this eternal Russia uh, and uh, uh, the present uh, the Putin's politics. You know, uh, interesting enough, if you look at the um, uh, Soviet period, especially at the Stalinist period, uh, so he very quickly returned to this idea of Russian empire and imperial history. During the 1920s, it was an attempt to create new ideology and new historical sequences you know, uh, but in the 30s, uh, Stalin and his clique realized uh, that there is not enough ideological tools and instruments in a way. So he absorbed this imperial period, uh, you know, very specifically in a way, uh, but he sort of adopted this eternal Russia into the Soviet canon. Uh, and what we can see now, it's the same thing to some extent. This is a great victory, but still we are uh, inheriting this, the great history of Russia. And some officials, which is really funny, uh, just to say that 
uh, if you compare the present day situation with the pre-revolutionary Russia, probably this is the period of Nicholas II. Um, in a way, funnily enough, we all remember how this poor czar ended, uh, very tragically, I would say. Uh, so it's funny that this image of internal Russia is still very powerful. Yeah, and I just want to, I want to just add really quickly that um, Harbinsky were very much aware of the changes going on in the 1930s. Ustralov, uh, who Stalin drew upon, Ustralov was a Harbinitz who returned in 35. Uh, and I argue in my book that this Nash, that they, they embrace national Bolshevism, even though the majority don't use the term, but they follow all of this, the resurrection of any of these pre-revolutionary heroes by Stalin. Um, to the point where, and, and that's part of them feeling the Soviet Union has changed, that, that it has become Russia again because it's returned to eternal Russia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's before they were patriot. Laurie, thank you so much. Uh, let's hope uh, there is a continuation of the discussion on the pages of our magazine. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, in a minute, uh, we will be back on air with uh, the next uh, last in the section paper, uh, Gans Ulbricht uh, from Stanford uh, University. <laughs> Dear colleagues, this is our last speech for today. Hans Ulrich Gumricht, Stanford University. Farewell to the to the violence of crowd. Please. Thank you. Um, so for those who are listening, uh, this will be a change of pace, so to speak. I mean, my full title, but always changes title, is crowd violence an intellectual exercise in ambiguity. I want to tease out the ambiguity of the concept and of the phenomenon of violence. Um, so different from speaking about institutions in uh, Soviet, pre-Soviet and post-Soviet Russian times, which is always a fantastic learning experience for me. I mean, I have learned tons this morning. This was quite fascinating. Um, I'll try to focus more or less philosophically uh, but not only with philosophical terms on what's supposed to be uh, the key concept of this year's uh, Bani, this year's bathhouse reading, the concept of violence. And what I will try to do is to construe a provocative uh, counterposition to what uh, is the normal focus within the humanities, uh, academic humanities, Geisteswissenschaften, on violence these days. Um, the light motif of what I'm doing is the ambiguity of the phenomenon of violence, the ambiguity of violence that should already surprise you because normally when we talk about violence among intellectuals, it's always bad. So I want to talk about the ambiguity of violence. And the reason why I'm doing that is not just and not only to provoke, uh, but I think we have to think about the phenomenon conceptually in order to achieve a differentiated and a realistic critique. Critique not in the sense of the Frankfurt School to say how bad it is, that is also important, but critique in the conscience sense. I mean, in the sense of what constitutes violence and what are the conditions, anthropologically speaking, anthropological in the German sense of the word, general human conditions of the impact of violence. As far as the form is concerned, I think you don't have to be too worried. Uh, uh, I will have five reflections. I will definitely be done by 8 p.m. Moscow time. Uh, 
10 a.m. Californian time, and then we have 15 minutes for discussions because, you know, I have another appointment at, at, at uh, 8.15 your time, but that's good for you. So it's not taking too long, even if there's urgency for discussion. I have five reflections, and each reflection has one thesis. And the first reflection concerns uh, my professional world, the world of the humanities, uh, the humanities and arts, as you sometimes say, in the United States. When people have been talking about the humanities in the last 50 years, or maybe last 30 years, there's always been much talking about turns. You know, there was an iconic turn, and there was a deconstructive turn, and there was an identity turn. There are always turns. So I would love to um, add one claim of a turn in the humanities that nobody talks about because pretty much everybody participates. So it's a non-declared turn in the humanities. I think the humanities have undergone during the past 20 years an unheard of moralistic turn. An unheard of moralistic turn. They have become unbearably moralistic. This is what political correctness is all about. Not only in the United States. I mean, I mean, if you are a Stanford professor, you always have to talk badly about Berkeley. That's a local obligation. So seemingly the first time ever that the concept political correctness was used was at a colloquium in the early 90s at Berkeley, Heidegger and political correctness. It was about the question whether you could remain a leftist reading Heidegger seriously. So, but I mean, what we call political correctness is not just an American phenomenon. I think it's worldwide in the humanities. What is it all about? It is about the warm and fuzzy, definitely not cold, the warm and fuzzy feeling of being on the morally good side. And that is always being on the side of the victims. I mean, you can then quote Walter Benjamin's historical reflections that the angel of history has an empathic relationship to the history of the victims. And, and, and that's a good thing, basically. But this has led, and this is where my critique starts, this has led to an omnipresent use of the word violence. Everything is called violent. I mean, every language that rubs somebody the wrong way, not even insulting, is called violent. I mean, there's also, and I think it's a problem, there is an overuse of the word rape. I mean, everything is now metaphorically called rape. I mean, whenever you insult a woman, it's called a rape. I mean, I think, and I'm talking seriously, not aggressively, out of respect for the victims of real violence and out of respect and compassion for the victims of real rape, for example, we have to come back to a less metonymical, a less metaphorical concept of violence. And therefore, and this is the end of my first reflection, my first thesis, and this is, would be food for thought for the colloquium, I propose the following definition of violence. It's a very concrete definition. It has nothing to do with Michel Foucault's of violence, and I'm a great Foucault admirer. So I would propose to call violence the occupation of spaces with bodies, against the resistance of other bodies. So again, I propose to call violence the occupation of spaces with bodies against the resistance of other bodies. I mean, if you think it through, that, for example, would be a very concrete description of what we call rape. Not only rape, but any kind of type of violence. But uh, I would think that out of respect for the victims, we should stop in the humanities and among intellectuals in general, this metonymical, metaphorical use of violence. Everything is violent. So I think we should have a specific concept of violence. Second reflection. From the side of uh, Russian history and from the side of German history, I'm only a US citizen since 2000, but nevertheless, of course, existentially being born in Germany three years after the suicide of Hitler, the, the history that I carry is a German history. I think from the Russian history side, from the German history side, and maybe from any national history, we have every reason to take uh, violence and the suffering of the victims of violence very seriously. Yeah? I mean, think of concentration camps in Germany, Think of the Gulag in Russia. I mean, maybe we even have specific histories. Yes, personally, 
I have every reason, and it has happened throughout my life, um, to identify if this were possible with the victims in my national history. I mean, I've been recently appointed um, a professor at the Hebrew University after my retirement of Stanford. I'm teaching there from time to time. And my friends in Israel tell me that I'm idiotically happy about that. I mean, this is, this is excessively happy. Why am I so excessively happy? Because, of course, there's a specific relationship in me. Until my death, I will feel I should do something to redeem, if that was ever possible, those victims of Nazi violence. And I think there are similar feelings in Russia. Okay, this is all evident. Now, here comes my uh, point of ambiguity. On a personal level, I do know, Irina knows that too, that's the difference that we have. I love to be in a stadium crowd. I love to be in a full stadium. For Carola, I'm a fan of Borussia Dortmund that has the largest stadium in Germany and the roughest fans. And when I go to a stadium, I love to be not just in the stadium. I mean, I mean as, as people know me at my club, they invite me to go to a lounge or something. No, I want to be on the standing only 30,000 Sue Tribune in Dortmund with the rough fans. Yeah, recently they told me they would give me protection if I go there because this, I love to be there. I love to be part of a crowd. And why do I love to be part of a crowd? Because I feel that this crowd is a matrix of violence. So I love to be there and I love to be at a rock concert. I love to be there, not in spite of that, but if I'm very honest, because I feel something, this goose flesh feeling that, I mean, not only that a crowd is a potential matrix of uh, violence and therefore we have to criticize it. I mean, what I'm telling you is like a confession, but I do feel I love to be on the Süd in Dortmund. Carola seems to know what I'm talking about. I love to be on the Süd and in other stadiums. I mean, it can be Stanford football, which is a stadium of 55,000. It gets full when our, our team plays. But I love to be because I feel this potential of violence. I don't want to hit the other people, but, but you get my point. So it is not only a matrix of violence. There is something fascinating about violence. So this is my second point, my second thesis, that it, I think it is important to take into account, not for everybody, I know, but that for many people who you would not kind of dismiss and, and criticize uh, being aggressive, there is something fascinating about this feeling of violence, which I will try to find out in my remaining three uh, reflections, what it is all about. Now, third reflection. Um, once you're fascinated by the topic of violence, and for me, the fascination came really from this fact that, I mean, I don't want to say I like violence, but there is this thing that I like to be in a crowd. Yeah. And I mean, it has nothing to do necessarily with sports. I mean, if you like to go to open air rock concerts, then you always also like to be in a crowd and ask yourself whether it doesn't have to be to do something with violence. Yeah? Even if you go to an open air mass read by the Pope where millions of people can assemble, Maybe, you know, you don't want to kill the Pope, but nevertheless, there is this feeling. Now, if you reflect this, and this is my third point, then you will discover a very strange tension. I mean, if you go into history, in history, of course, uh, we have a certain light motif, a certain genealogy of the charismatic crowd. Yeah? I mean, think of the French Revolution, it is seemingly clear. I mean, July 13th was a very hot summer day, 1789 in Paris. Uh, people were concerned about what was going on in politics with this proto-assembly being in Versailles. And all of a sudden, on the morning of July 14, there are 80,000 people in front of that building that still exists, Les Invalides. Nobody had summoned them there. There was no leader. And all of a sudden, those 80,000 people, and the number grows, go to the other side of Paris, to La Bastille. Nobody told them to go there, but it was in the end 150,000 people, plus minus. And they conquered that fortress, in which there were only five prisoners, so it didn't make much political sense. And yet, this prise de la Bastille, this occupation of the Bastille, became... The central mythology, the positive mythology of the uh, French Revolution, this was crowd violence. But crowd violence became so important, so positive, 
that if I'm correctly informed in the Russian, the Soviet case of the October Revolution, there was not much crowd violence, but you had to invent crowd violence to give the October Revolution a legitimacy. Yeah? So the, the, the capability of the crowd to be violent without leadership, this is very important, there is no general, there is no brain, crowd becomes an agent, has a very positive connotation in history. On the other side, I mean, if you look at the, what do historians say about, uh, intellectuals say about crowds, there is only a negative genealogy. So here I want to point again, there's an ambiguity. Intellectuals celebrate crowds when it comes to crowd violence in the French Revolution, but they condemn, they despise crowds when it comes to talking about crowds. Genealogy, the first book uh, ever doing that was a book by Gustave Le Bon, an okay but not fantastic French intellectual, right-wing intellectual who was fearing crowds. So he writes in 1893, he publishes a book on crowds um, um, and crowd violence. It's about what happens when you are in a crowd. When you are in a crowd, you lose your rationality and therefore beware of being in a crowd. This is very negative. So when you are in a crowd, you become an inferior type of being. And banal as this argument is, it may also be true, I mean, it has a huge genealogy. I mean, Sigmund Freud, for me, one of the greatest intellectuals ever, copies Le Bon's argument when he talks about crowds. You lose your rationality. About you find that in Ortega y Gasset, who is not quite in the league of, 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 of Sigmund Freud, but nevertheless, in Elias Canetti, I'm not a great Canetti fan, but you find it in my friend Peter Sloterdijk today. I mean, intellectuals, when they talk about crowd and crowd violence, there's normally a condemnation. So what do you do then? You have on the one, on the one side this charismatic reference of intellectuals to crowd violence. And on the other side, this absolute condemnation. So there's no clear position. What are you doing, going to do with it? This is why uh, I thought, and this is my fourth reflection, that I should try and go about this phenomenologically. Phenomenologically in the sense of Husserl, namely to observe myself when I'm under this goose flesh-like fascination of crowd violence. Yeah? I mean, what happens to me when I'm standing uh, in a stadium. I mean, not only to me, but what happens to 84,000 other people being in a stadium or 200,000 people being in a rock concert in Wembley Stadium or whatever. Okay, this is my fourth reflection. I think to observe how crowds are related to violence, if you want to find it out, you have to take into account three dimensions. The first dimension is a lateral dimension. Lateral. I mean, in the sense that if you stand next to each other and you don't even talk to this other person, there is a tendency that you copy the body movements of this other person, that you do the same body movements. I mean, everybody has been knowing that for a long time, but since 20 years ago, due to the research of Italian brain researchers and neurologists, we know that there are mirror neurons, yeah? certain neurons that initiate you to copy what you see with your body. So you can observe that. I mean, this is how dancing functions and people who dance really well, they're able to copy with their body and without thinking. I always have to think that's why I can, can never be a good dancer, but who copy that. So there's this lateral, you, I mean, that already, if you are in a stadium and that is a contained space, and if, if, if it's very narrow in the stadium, if everybody starts moving, everybody starts jumping, for example, there is already a threat of violence. There's no direction, but there's a threat of violence. So lateral dimension. Second dimension I call transitive. When you are in a crowd, not necessarily, but oftentimes, there's a focus of attention. When you are in a stadium, there's the game going on. Yeah. Uh, if you are at a mass, I mean, the Pope is reading a mass, then you have the Pope and the altar. Uh, if you are at a rock concert, it is the band. Now, that means that this focus of attention, this focus of attention can initiate, can trigger mimetic movement. Yeah. I mean, you all know that when you're a sports fan, 
somebody shoots or somebody throws the ball in American football and baseball, this is not mirror neurons. You want to do the same movement. Or if they score a goal, you want to jump up. So this adds to this explosive situation. There can be violence. And in the moment also, if there are fans of another team, it can get very tense. Yeah? I mean, when Stanford plays Arizona State in American football, the Arizona Sun Devils at, at, at Stanford, it can get in the stadium, especially between the student crowds, it can get very tense. And then there is a third dimension, and this is this goose flesh dimension. I mean, if you like to be in a crowd, and once again, I have to flagellate myself. Yes, I do like being in crowds. If you like to be in a crowd, you have this goose flesh feeling. My goose flesh, you can also see, you feel elevated. Yeah, this is why I like to be in a crowd, because there is a possibility of me to feel elevated. I feel something that I don't feel normally, that I cannot feel when I'm uh, alone. And what is it that leads to this feeling elevated? I think, and this is what I associate with being in a crowd, it is intensity. It is intensity. It is something also that we have been, or that I have been, enormously missing uh, in corona times, in COVID times. You know, I think if you would, a linguist would count how often we use the word intense and intensity today as compared to two years ago. We all use it much more often. Now, interestingly, or sadly, the concept of intensity has never received much philosophical attention, except for Gilles Deleuze in A Thousand Plateaus. I'm not going to quote Deleuze now, but what I will propose you in my fourth reflection, and maybe as the central definition to take into account when you think about violence, a definition of intensity is initiated, is, 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 is inspired uh, by Gilles Deleuze. Now, Deleuze, or Deleuze, as they are calling him in the United States, speaks about intensity in the first place as a process. Intensity is not just the state, but intensity is a process. And he says it is a process that leads from absolute contingency, I would explain that in a moment, from absolute contingency to a black hole situation, to a black hole situation, a trou noir. He really literally says black hole. Now, what does that mean? We are all familiar with what this definition says. We sometimes, on a situation, you're standing there with other people in the stadium. And when you are coming to the stadium and you're not organized, I mean, anything can happen. You can get into a conversation with them. You can get into a fight with them. You cannot talk to them, et cetera, et cetera. That would be the German sense of contingence, the French sense of contingence. Anything can happen. But if... In the process of being in a rock concert or in the process of being at a Pope's Mass or in the process of being in a stadium, being in a crowd, you get into this process of intensity that may happen and may not happen. You go from this absolute openness, from the situation of contingency to a black hole situation, to a black hole situation where you don't choose anymore what you are doing, where you are doing in unison with what the crowd is doing, where you become precisely something that sociologists have never described, namely a group of people whose commonality is not based on solidarity, on shared interests, on shared class situations, etc., etc., but on shared physical presence. You become what Christian theology in the third century, referring to Christ being the embodied God, was saying, the church is, or Christ, Christianity is, Christ's mystical body. You get my point. In a crowd, through a process of intensity, you can become a mystical body in that sense, quote unquote. It's a theological concept. I'm not talking about theology. A group where individually you do not think anymore independently, where you act in unison with that crowd. And that has a feeling of being elevated. I mean, yes, that has this goose flesh feeling. This is why I like to go to a stadium. But that cannot exist without a risk of violence. That cannot exist without a risk of violence. That is my main point. There is something positive about it. There's a temptation about it. There's a temptation about violence. 
about violence in the crowd, but at the same time, you cannot get it without a risk of violence. Okay, final reflection. I think Irina will be relieved that for once I'm only using 20 minutes or maybe 22 minutes. Fifth reflection. Now, what shall we do with this kind of finding? I mean, this is, I uh, tried to say, I will have a phenomenological reflection on what happens when you are in a crowd and how that is related to violence. So, I mean, this is not necessarily military violence, but could also be military. But you do that by raising the prices enormously. Yeah? I mean, if you look at the American professional leagues, I mean, I'm a fan of practically all sports. So I would love to have tickets for the uh, National Football League and for the National Baseball League to watch the San Francisco Giants, et cetera, et cetera. But this is very expensive in the United States. Yeah, I mean, the normal hardcore fan can simply not afford to buy a ticket for any location to go to a stadium. And nevertheless, there are enough people, the stadiums are always full. So this is why when you go uh, to an American professional sports event or stadium compared to Europe, it's a very clean event. There is, objectively speaking, they have measured that much less risk of violence at an NFL game than at a Bundesliga game in Germany or probably a first league soccer game in Russia, you know, where you have hardcore fans. In Germany, they call them ultras. But in Germany, also, the soccer federation tries now to exclude ultras, I mean, the, the, the hardcore fans, the violent, potentially, and not always violent, potentially violent fans from the state. Huh? Now, I mean, I regret that because despite my age of 73 years and beginning to be frail, I like to be in such a crowd. I regret that too, because um, even if I'm not part of the crowd, I mean, Carola seems to know a little bit about the mythology of the stadium in Dortmund. You go there partly because of the crowd. Yeah, because there, there is some temptation. It's dangerous, you know, it's dangerous, but there is something tempting about it. Now, it turns out that my country, the country of whom I'm a citizen and the country I love, the United States, I mean, it's late patriotism. And, uh, but that country that has been so successful in purifying stadium violence is probably the country with the highest degree of personal violence. Yeah? I mean, the risk that you go to a supermarket, get shot in the United States is much higher probably than in Russia, definitely than in any country of the European Union. Now, I'm not saying this is a, a, a unilateral function, but my point of reflection, and that is the final reflection, is whether there is not a risk in the intellectual pledge uh, that the best thing you can do is to create a society completely free of violence. Because it could be it could be, I don't know, but it could be that this goose flesh desire of which I'm speaking, this desire to use the positive word to be elevated, this desire to be part of a mystical body, as I called them, which always implies the risk of violence. It could be that this is an anthropological desire anthropological in the German sense of the word. It could be that this is a desire that belongs to being humans, that belongs to being humans in the non-Cartesian sense, that belongs to being humans that have a body. And if this was the case, if this was the case that, you know, even those who don't like to go to sports events, but there is a temptation of violence, then I think instead of dreaming that dream of an absolute exclusion of violence, that may be politically and socially speaking a higher risk operation, whether it would not be better to think about certain rituals, yeah? I mean, in stadiums are such rituals, uh, where there is a possibility for this violence to articulate itself without a high degree of danger and risk in the private sphere. So my final point would be, and I'm not saying this has to be, I mean, this is the reflection about now you say, well, I'm saying I talk about the ambiguity of violence. 
Uh, my final point is the question whether if you take seriously what most um, academics, most intellectuals are proposing, eliminate violence as best you can, any type of violence from society, whether this is not more dangerous than admitting certain types of violence or the risk of certain types of violence under certain institutional conditions. And uh, I very much thank you for the attention to a non given to a non-Russianist at the end of a very intense evening in Europe and morning in California. Thank you, sir, Funny, everybody for has a smile on their face. That may be uh, because uh, uh, thinking of stadiums. <laughs> um, it was. I don't hear. Uh, it was. Now I hear. Uh, thing I, I just said it was uh, really and in, in captivating, and of course the more because it, because you you spoke based on your own experience and you with your own, own emotions and while we're collecting the questions and uh, commentaries I just wanted to mention the author. Uh, whom you, when, when enumerating the other ones who, who were speaking on behalf of violence, uh, on behalf of Georges Bataille, and uh, uh, who spoke about the inevitability of violence, of yeah. uh, thirst for, for violence, of the highest uh, uh, delights that are connected to it, and who asked to bring the, it back, to bring the ritual forms back. Of the collective of the collective forms, the sports and festivities that would be enable us to articulate violence. Yeah, I mean the Dionys Dionysian plays in ancient Athens, for example, were such a ritual hmm? with the risk of violence. There was violence actually happening. Not only a competition for the best tragedy, but Laurie, I think Laurie is. Yeah, so I we just, have a, I a West Coast dialogue, Laurie. Yeah, <laughs> in the Pacific Twelve. <laughs> No, Pacific an American Republic. one, uh, from the point of view of an American uh, yeah, with yeah. all our guns and all our violence and all our contact sports. So I have just two quick points. Uh, one is that I think this is very gendered. So yeah. as, as I was listening to your presentation, I'm wondering, you know, how many of these hardcore fans, you know, going in and, and, and excited with the goosebumps, I, I bet almost all of them are men. I may be wrong. I, I'm not a fan of contact sports. But to me, I think that um, as a woman, I, I react differently to potential violence, right? It frightens me um, in a way that it, it may not a man who, who feels that he can perhaps hold his own if, if he has to. Um, so I think there's something, something gendered here. And, uh, and that's important because you're talking about the human condition and, uh, you know, women make up uh, more than 50% of the population. Uh, the second is though, when you're, when you're talking about, you know, the ritualized having a safe space for this to happen, I mean, isn't that the point of contact sports, which I think in the United States, uh, we have more contact sports uh, than, than elsewhere. I mean, the rest of the world has ice hockey, but we have this strange American football, which is, so incredibly violent. Um, so I just wondered how you felt on those yeah, two Okay, this is beautiful, and I think this is American in a good sense. We couldn't we couldn't disagree more. But I mean, this is I mean, this is why you formulated what you formulate, and I really appreciate that you did. Um, uh, as to your first question, you may be surprised if I'm saying that I both agree and disagree. I mean, I agree profoundly in the sense. That it seems to be very strange. They're, they're, I mean, okay, if you if you are not honest, there are only people, of course, in our world, in the academic world, we all condemn and hate violence. If you are honest, uh, then there are people who have this fascination of violence, and those who are not. Um, as far as um, uh, American football, for example, watching, you know, and not only the the, the object of attention, uh, but the stadium experience. Um, yes, I mean, in the olden days, it was mainly a male thing, uh, but I think this is shifting now. And uh, I mean, I haven't done any empirical research, but um, if I talk to people, uh, I would not necessarily say that I find more men than women when I'm saying I can be tempted by the goose flesh feeling of being in a crowd. 
Yeah? Because once you talk not about contact sports, about hockey or American football, but uh, I mean, I could mention that my wife is a big football fan. It's the only sport she's ever liked. And she's not, I mean, there's no ideology behind that. I mean, she's German born as I am. But nevertheless, the, the point I want to make is um, that yes, there is a split. Not everybody feels that, but if only 50% or 40% of the population felt that, it could be a problem to just say we eliminate violence, okay? So, I mean, it may be more gender than I think. It may be less gender than you think. This is very difficult. I think this is where empirical research would have to start. But that is a point. A second uh, remark, and that there, I don't think we have a big consensus. I mean, this is the Pac-12, maybe the Pac-12 consensus, Pac-12 is the league in which both uh, the team of Laurie's University, Arizona State and Stanford play. And they're two very, they have good teams in all sports. So anyway, uh, I think that yes, this preference of contact sports, and I think it's a positive thing, is a possibility to have this possibility of, of letting violence, I mean, mm -hmm. articulate itself without major consequences. I mean, yes, it can have consequences on the brains of players, but they're thinking about better helmets. Okay. Whatever. Yes, I completely agree with you. The problem that I see in the U.S., and this is more in professional sports than in, um, than in um, uh, college sports, which is the big division, is that precisely due to the prize politics and the politics in general, there are no more hardcore fans in the stadiums. You get my point? I mean, there's a potential due to what is being featured to the game that people get kind of this crowd feeling, but as you're all sitting in very expensive lounges and boxes, it doesn't happen. So what, what could be the positive, I mean, it does happen in rock concerts. Yeah? I mean, Woodstock was such a festival and it is interesting in that sense, and this is the last sentence in the first answer, uh, that it's a nice coincidence that the stadiums are increasingly used now, A, uh, for rock concerts, for musical events where you can have this goose flesh feeling, or for religious uh, context. Mm -hmm. yeah? I mean, mm -hmm. if the Pap wants to read a mass in London, there's nothing better than Wembley Stadium. Okay, Laurie, many, many thanks. Uh, you know, Sepp, thank you so much. You know, in a way, in my youth, uh, I was a very um, great uh, hockey fan. And so I, I watched uh, the Russian, the Soviet hockey, which was wonderful. fantastic, way. unbelievable. No, and I lost my voice in a way. Uh, so I have some experience of the kind you <laughs> described in a way. But, you know, I think uh, still uh, these stadiums and all these sports events, it's, um, I think, one of the most effective uh, means of taming uh, of violence in a way, uh, because you know uh, you can see the public reaction to the violent fans who start fighting or shouting or roaming on the streets, and it's always felt like a breaking of rules, because the inner rule is you never uh, show you you can only shout you know and be enthusiastic and be friendly to your colleagues in a way, but never step over. You know, otherwise you lose all the idea of the game and of the fans in a way. So I think in this way, it's really instrument of taming of the violence, yeah. but not, not releasing, you know, not releasing in a way. And I just wanted to, to say there's a wonderful book by Robert Mechamblet. Uh, I don't remember the exact um, uh, title now, but it's about violence in the medieval European society and where yeah. he shows what different means the governments and the rulers invented, you know, to prevent this inner violence or to tame it in a way. And uh, it was interesting enough, uh, speaking about gender, uh, that the medieval society realized that the major threat was coming from the young adults from 15 to 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the special attention <laughs> was given to them. First, these early marriages, uh, in a way that let them be with a woman, and many other things, in a way, you know, to... Tournaments, then. Yes, to, uh, you know, to fight, in a way. So I think, I think that it's much more complicated, uh, you know, whether it's... Uh, censored violence or i mean sports and all this massive events oh. or a good invented means of suppressing violence. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I talked about sports because that, I mean, as you know, but as a former hockey fan, you know, too, that allowed me to do this phenomenological insight, you know, and, and really, this is how I, I mean, you know, I wrote a little book about it. This is how I got to it because I, I can, I can more or less describe what happens to me. Now, uh, as a real answer, the point I want to make once again, and this is why I called it ambiguity of violence, is I wanted to get out of this in a way, you know, in a Kantian way, as well as a critique of violence. Say, okay, what are the conditions of dealing with this phenomenon? And I said, there's reason to say to only eliminate it, to only condemn it, or to say the less the better is problematic and have problematic consequences. I mean, I think Laurie and I agree on this one. You cannot clearly draw a line from repression of violence in stadiums to the violence on the street in the U.S. But, but there is something, especially on the West Coast, people are super polite. I mean, you don't, I mean, you never curse, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the risk that you get shot or raped or whatever, uh, you know, when you go to your supermarket is relatively high. So this, um, now, um, Irina, with the um, second answer, and then I stop, uh, the taming, not only, I think the taming, I get your point, and it's true. Uh, the taming can only be efficient if you are in a situation where more of that goose flesh feeling or potential violence feeling is provoked. It first has to be provoked, and then the taming comes in. Yeah? I mean, you could say maybe like a medieval tournament where nobody was supposed to die if they ever really took place, but where this aggression was provoked, and then there were rules. Uh, uh, for example, in my case... Um, when I go to Stanford Stadium, I park my car about uh, 20 minutes away from the stadium because when I, if the game gets really good and when I go out of the stadium and I am in this kind of, I would be a very dangerous driver. Yeah, that, that would be, so to speak, a, a personal measurement of uh, taming. Yeah? But, but in order for that to come in, in order for me to think about it, oh, I'm a potentially dangerous driver, I have to be in this specific situation. Okay. You know, I just uh, uh, forgot to, to tell you um, something in a way. You know, you spoke about the crowds at the stadiums and yeah. in general, being in crowd, you know, just yeah. feeling this aggression. But there, are, there could be some different experiences and my personal experience as well. This is a peaceful uh, demonstration, uh, I would say, which we had quite a lot in Russia recently, uh, before the COVID. This is absolutely a different situation. Again, being in this crowd, you are elevated because it's not aggressive. And on the contrary, the aggression comes from the uh, policemen and provocators and many of them. So it's absolutely different type of crowd, but it's crowd as well. Okay, here's oh, what I describe this situation. What I propose, I finish on a positive note about crowds. Uh, I know that, I mean, I was really curious that Carola wanted to ask something and Johannes had to ask something, but I have to leave. I have an appointment that comes from the non synchronicity of. I mean, if you, I would be so grateful, Johannes and Carola, if you write me a line, can be a one liner. And as you see, I love to talk, so I write you much more than a one liner back. Okay. Here, Irina, I want to add. add end on a positive example and this is again from this stadium so this is uh, this is the Dortmund stadium the largest st stadium in continental Europe with a famously rough zoo tribune yeah I mean 30,000 standing only it's the only stadium in Central Europe where 30,000 people are still standing okay so there's a game uh, they had they always end up second in the German league Munich wins the championship and Dortmund is second that's that never changes and so like five or three days before the league is over, you know, nothing happens. They play against an okay, but not very good team, mind zero five. And at halftime, they lead to zero and the supporters are very rough and they shout and everything. And then they come back in the second half and no noise from the stands, no noise from the ultras, no noise from the crowd. And, um, and then they score a third goal, nothing. I mean, yes, the normal fans are clapping, but the, the hardcore fans don't react. They're silent. And uh, then they score a fourth goal, nothing. And the players get really nervous. They don't know what's going on. They're protesting. And then two minutes before the game is over, 
uh, that stadium crowd, the 30,000 standing only people, they sing the song that they sing in Liverpool and in Dortmund, You Never Walk Alone. They all turn around and leave the stadium. So when the game is over, 4-0 for Dortmund, uh, there were 30,000 people less in the stadium. The suit was completely empty. What had happened? What had happened was that in the, at, at halftime, no, no specific reason, two of the 30,000 hardcore fans died of heart attacks. And there was nobody who concerted that, no conductor who said, this was the reaction, clearly. I mean, it is now documented. So this was, again, the mystical body, right? But nobody communicated. I mean, they had seen that there were Zanis, as you say in Germany, that there were nurses who carried these people out on a stretcher. And somebody had spread the word that they had died. You get my point. This is another reaction of a crowd that is elevating, that has to do with this goose flesh feeling and that is absolutely nonviolent. I wanted to give this example. I mean, first of all, to end on a positive note on crowds. I mean, whose reputation among inter intellectuals is too unilaterally negative. I think it's too unilaterally negative. But also because I completely agree with you, it is not only the potential of violence. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are other potentials there. And if you speak intellectually, I would say, and this was part of what I what I wanted to achieve, quote unquote, with my contribution. I mean, uh, via crowd, the topic of violence has a much broader intellectual potential of things to be thought about, of things being implicit, than just how can we avoid violence. Yeah? I mean, a crowd has potentials as a quote unquote mystical body of elevation that are exactly, and I fully agree with you, Rita, very peaceful in a way that a speech about peace cannot achieve. I mean, in a way, like this ritual of mourning those people who died at halftime is so moving that whenever I see the footage of it, I, I start crying. But now, I mean, as you look at me like uh, astonished, I will not cry. Uh, I will thank you very, very much for having been in Moscow, in a way, having been at Arizona State, having been in uh, Jena, all places are very much love. And to say Schlusswort, I hope, I mean, you see the California light coming in. <laughs> I hope I'll be in Moscow again next year. Thanks so much. Sepp, we have one question from YouTube. You don't have time, right? Okay, one, 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 one. Okay, then I, one, but, but one fast, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they ask the comments of case in Belarus, the charismatic crowd in Minsk, uh, 400,000, which doesn't, crowd which doesn't want violence. A commentary to the question. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, the, this, uh, uh, and the uh, notion, German notion of elatedness excludes violence. Yeah. Okay, I mean, there is a, I mean, I can re refer to a book of a very, very famous colleague from Berkeley. So for once I say something positive about Berkeley. Uh, and that is Judith Butler. Uh, I mean, whose most famous book is Gender Trouble and Bodies That Matter. And they were very, very important books. But her latest book is A Theory of Assembly. And it is a theory of assembly that astonishingly, she doesn't use that word very frequently, is a phenomenological analysis of crowds. And Butler precisely, she doesn't mention Belarus because the book, I mean, she, re, she refers a lot to, to Maidan. She refers a lot to Ukraine and to Kiev. Yeah? What happened there in terms of political assembly? Because there too, through the permanent continued presence of a crowd, in a public space and it was just not possible to 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 make people clear that space um there was a political impact that i think no individual no organized party could have achieved and this is exactly uh what butler is analyzing in her book i think it is a very very important book and now i do another schlusswort but this is now quoting butler um, I think it's a philosophical sentence, complicated but beautiful. She said, from a political po point of view, what a crowd mainly articulates without saying it 
is the right to have rights. I think this is very, very beautiful. By occupying a space, you make a claim to have rights, not specific rights, whichever rights these are. But by being assembled, you make it clear that you have a right to have rights. I think this is, I mean, it's a very, very important book. I mean, uh, you know, compared to other books, I mean, I think it should have more of an attention. I don't know whether it is already translated into Russian. I think if not, it would be a typical NLO book. And um, I'm not necessarily, as Irina can easily guess, of the Judith Butler fan club, but this is an important book. Okay, now I have to really run, which is good for me if I have to run. Thank you so much, Seb. We hope that uh, tomorrow, during the fourth session, we will be able to ask the questions we were not able to ask today. And dear colleagues, those who joined us only today, I want to remind you that, we, that within the frame of our conference, uh, we ha want to ask the question, why study violence? How can we study violence within different uh, disciplines? Where are the borderlines between violence and non-violence? What's the origin of violence? And how could we articulate violence if we take um, uh, it, it as it was in the last report that violence is inevitable? So we're waiting for you tomorrow at our last session, uh, Culture and Violence which would be dedicated to the symbolic violence and, and the, its representations in art, performative practice and literature. Irina Prokhorov will, will be the moderator. Please come and join us. Thank you.